Hey, we're, we're live. live. All, All right. right. Hello, Hello. Welcome, welcome everybody to our very sixth uh, live stream. I just, I just noticed how, how dirty, dirty my nails, nails are. That's, 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 that's always a wonderful thing to do on live stream. Yep. Yep. Always, always the best. Wow. So, uh, welcome, welcome everybody. everybody. I'm, I'm Steve Thomas, Thomas at Choice Meetings on your social media of choice. And welcome, like, like I said, to our very sixth live stream. Now, now I'm going to hide my hands until I can finish cleaning up my nails. I'm joined by my co host, the sugar to my salger, refugee of Mount Hot Now, and half a whole orc, Adam Grimm, Beach Vacation Mando on Insta. How you doing, buddy? Um, I'm doing quite well after. Is it doing that thing? Yep. Uh, yeah, you're probably talking right now, but I managed to mess up the audio settings. Give me one second. We're doing the thing. Can I hear you now? Um, I don't know. I can hear you now. Hey! hey. All right. You were probably talking on stream, too. It's yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you sound very far away on the stream. Cool. That's nifty. Let's change that a little bit. How about we? Like almost. How about, How about now? now? How, How do, do I sound? sound? That's it's this kind of the same. Let me continue talking, talking as. I don't know, know if anybody is watching us right now or in the future when you're, you're watching us. Uh, we've. I've, I've done, done some upgrades to uh, my streaming setup here, here and we're still getting familiar with them. So I'm going to be moving the microphone closer to my face. Any, Any better, Adam? Um, let's see. Let's, let's, uh, how's how's that, that doing? doing? Like a, a tinny far away. Tinny far, far away. away. That's, That's probably, probably not, not such, such a great sound. sound. How about, How about now? I'm going to continue talking as we live mix this because, you know, that's life. It's getting better. It is getting better. Okay. Well, getting better is what we can hope for. In the meantime, I'm going to go make sure that my actual filters are all working so that this sounds better. We're going to use the compressor. I'm, I'm going to continue talking. This is a tiny orc. We're, We're going to be painting our tiny orc today uh, in the style of the Orkland Raiders. So you guys can see right here. This is our, this was one of the test models. This isn't going to be the absolute Bible for these guys, but it's pretty close. Like I'm pretty happy with how this dude looks. So we'll, we'll use him as an example of where we're going to get to with this guy. How are we sounding now, Adam? Not better? Not better. Oh, it's still the kind of tinny far away. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. cool. But it, it, is, it is drastically better than from the beginning. All right. Well, drastically better is better. Let's just make sure that, that there it is. How is that? Is that better? Oh, that is that is so much better. There's no oh, thank goodness, no, no tinniness. All right. Well, we finally figured out what it is that was the issue. That's cool because now I don't have like 17 echoes going in my head either, which is nice. Uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the black works from our Orkland Raiders. Uh, he is he is going to be uh, styled after the Oak Orkland. Or <laughs> Well, he is an Orkland Raider, uh, but he is going to be styled after the Orkland. Oh, oh, I'm never going to be able to say it the right way again. Oakland Raiders, now Las Vegas Raiders of the NFL. Uh, they have a pretty uh, well-known color scheme of being black and silver. So we're going to just deal with this guy, give him a little bit of a paint job. Today, we're going to be working a little bit. So we, we did some last week. We did a whole bunch of models where we developed some shadows. This week, I'm going to just focus on this one because I feel like it's a little bit nicer when we can go through and get all the way through a step. Uh, I'm going to be doing the highlights on his armor. So um, the highlights on his armor are going to be using a variety of colors. Um, I'll open up the palette cam and we can start ta talking about what's on ye olde palette. Uh, so we have our midtone. This is uh, abyssal blue. So we're using this abyssal blue color as our midtone for all these guys. 
Uh, I'll make sure that that's actually on stream. This is just scale 75 or scale color abyssal blue. Uh, and then for our highlight color, we're using, you can see I haven't even got it mixed on there. So we've got our Tenere yellow just and, and our uh, white sands. So these are two, we're gonna make sort of a warm highlight color out of these. Uh, also on the palette, I've got graphene. Uh, I'm also probably at some point gonna get to play with black, uh, but we're using the graphene and the abyssal blue more to make our midtones today. So yeah. Um, if we're if you're in chat, let us know how you're feeling today, how you're how you're doing. And uh, Adam, I know you've already sort of answered this question, but I wasn't paying attention because I was dealing with audio issues. How are you doing today, man? Um, I'm pretty good. I'm I'm glad to be indoors now. Yeah, Calgary was not a nice place to be today. No, especially if you had to spend it outside. Yeah, uh, I took my dogs for a walk for for lunch today, like for my lunch break. And uh, it sucked. <laughs> it was oh, cold nice. and snowy, and we were back down under, you know, 32 degrees for American yeah. viewers and zero degrees for Canadian viewers. And, you know, the entire rest of the world except for Burma. Yes, except for Burma. Except for Burma and the United States. You know, those two powerhouses. Always associated with Fahrenheit, right? Right. Hmm. So... Uh, I. Dude, you know, pretty good until. Oh, okay, there. I just have to make an account now with Pop Goes. Never had to. Ah, uh, you're ordering stuff while we're talking, hey? Yes, yes, I am. I am ordering uh, off Pop Goes the Monkey. One, Lepnir grab bike, no torso, no skull. Neat. Yeah, because I'm. I want. I'm going to use this one because it looks more like a, it's like a grab bike chopper. Cool. So I'm going to make. Give that to my captain. Who? Uh, and then once uh, the guy I've been talking to on Instagram, give him a shout out. What's his What's his name? Oh god, I can't. I gotta. All right. Well, you up. can find it later. It's not that big a deal. It's where is it? Where is it? Oh my god, he's so far down. I talked to that many people. That doesn't. I know uh, it, this many people. Yeah, uh, it is the Uplander. Oh, uh, on IG, uh, two P's and up. Okay, U P P Lander. Cool. Um, he has made some amazing grab bike conversions, and he's currently in the process of working out a way to kind of mass produce them. Neat. Um, so he can sell the. The Outrider bike conversion kits, and they are amazing. Like they, I love how they look. It's very, it's a very simple conversion. Like you, you essentially, you shave off a bit of the front and a bit of the back, and then you put these things on that look like you know the grab plates that you see on all the new Primaris Space Marine tanks. Cool, but they're on bikes, and it, they just look really good. Hey, I love the aesthetic of the old uh, Custodia's grab bikes, so count me in on that one. That sounds like a cool conversion kit. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited. I'm just waiting kind of for him to send me a message and be like, yo, selling these now. Here's the link to the store. Actually, I've been kind of, I've been on him a little bit since like he first showed them. Neat. I mean, the one... Uh one dude that i actually did that with you remember uh my legion board so i we yeah. played star wars legion for a little while i painted up the starter box and then kind of it wasn't really enough expansion there for a little while and it was hard to get things and i sort of like pulled back but um i have a bunch of tatooine terrain that i, I grabbed from the guy or imperial i guess it's just really imperial colonist terrain like it's not necessarily yeah a specific to tattooing but that's where most people remember it from at any rate uh i grabbed some stuff from a guy who was just like hey i 3d modeled this and printed it for myself um if anybody wants them just let me know and i was like dude i'll take some uh that guy is now imperial terrain so if you see him advertising on facebook and ig and all over the place uh yeah i was his third customer so when he started that off, he was literally just, 
like, hey, I made this for me. Does anybody else want some? And I was like, yeah, here, have my money. And he was like, okay, it's going to take me a while because I got to like print this on my own. And I was like, I don't care. Send it to me when it's done. So yeah, we got a bunch of terrain from him real early in his career, which was, it's cool to see I how big he's gotten that. since then. So I, I do remember being a fan of your um, Star Wars Legion board. But I am, I, I am on your side with kind of why I didn't really get into that. It's two factions. Yeah, and, and two factions, it's, especially... Yeah, Hive and Villainy faction, please. Yeah, Scum and Villainy is really the one that I think would really make that game worth playing. And not just mm -hmm. as hireable. Like, they're, they're in there as mercenaries. Like, you can get Boba Fett and you can get... Um, I don't know, actually know if you can get any more... Of the scum of hive and villainy but i feel like you should be able to by now i do know they just released a like five man squad of mandalorians yeah that you can not... also do sabine uh the ren clan too so yeah so um just to actually talk about the model that i got in my hand right now i'm just doing real rough um highlights so i'm just coming in so you guys can see on the palette what i've got there this is a really yellowy uh just a, a desaturated yellow color that I'm coming in with. And right now we're just building up big blocks of this lighter color. Um, we'll go back and blend this a little bit better later, but you can see I'm I'm being very sketchy about this too. Like I'm not taking a huge amount of time to um, pull particular detail yet because we're going to be going back and forth with color. So just like we did with shadow where we were going sort of back and forth between the midtones and the darks, we're doing the same thing here. So. What we're trying to do is, if I can get this into the camera, we essentially, if you look down this way, this is basically the direction that I'm forcing light on this model. So I want there to be like a heavy spotlight coming in this direction. In order to do that, we're putting, we're putting a lot of light in one direction and then we'll sort of render out what the actual texture of the individual bits is afterwards. So the way that you kind of control where light is on a model is by while well, placing your highlights so unlike the uh the gw style where it's all just uh put down a base coat wash it add you know add highlights uh, or add edge highlighting and be done with it um, when you're actually trying to control where your light source is and what your lighting looks like it's it's a little bit more of an artistic choice about where you're going to actually put uh highlight and shadow and in our case we're also going to be going that extra step of making the difference between matte materials and very, very glossy materials. So some of this guy is going to end up being a very matte material and some of it is going to be a very glossy material. And even though that is the case, um, I'm painting this all in extremely matte paint. Like we are, we're using scale 75, the maddest paint of all the maddest paints that have ever matted paint. And uh, yeah, that's gonna give us a little extra extra bead, like a little extra challenge to deal with. So, yeah. All right, fun news. What's that? I now have a Slepnir grab bike on its way. Nice. Yep. Only one though. Mm. Only one. Because they, I mean, if they're they're twenty seven ninety nine for the monkey resin and i did upgrade it to the smooth high quality plastic so it's a little bit closer to gwish plastic Excuse uh me. yeah a little a little bit closer to that plastic um because honestly like it's gw and warlords like they got that plastic multi-part kit down yeah man I, I think honestly warlords probably the only other company that i know of personally that does uh, a multi-part plastic kit that is on par with Games Workshop. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Like, I don't really have a... I can't really think of a competitor on that one, to be honest with you. And it's not that there yeah. aren't competitors out there, but... Um, yeah, that's nifty neato. I'm, I'm excited for you to get the Slepnir. Yeah, and I think I'm on this... Well, on... This weekend, some point, I'm going to um, go to PM and pick up some glue because apparently both my uh, Tamiya cement and the white cap yep. and my Tamiya extra thin cement in the green cap 
uh, don't like to work. That's unfortunate. I'm right, a big fan of green cap. Just that's the ultra thin. Like, that is the one yeah, that my, I use definitely the most. Yeah, my green cap is about half full, and my cement is a little under half. Like maybe a, I'm at like a third left. That's fair. Um, when I get down to that point where, when you try to get any more out of the bottle, and we've talked about this on other streams, but I'm a big proponent of when you get down to that point where it's really hard to get any more out of the bottle in Tamiya, uh, that's when I start turning them into um, Sprugu. Because <laughs> there's always that point where you either have to pull the little, like, stupid brushy thing here. Like, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to see, and that cap is not very stable, but you can see there's a little brushy thing in there. That brush is supposed to telescope out, and every time I've actually gone through the process of trying to telescope out that brush, the brush has fallen apart on me, and then we'll never ever stay together ever again. Because uh, they hate me. At any rate, uh, their hatred of, of me aside, um, it's always one of those things that when it gets down below where it can dip naturally to it, that's where I just start chucking bits of dead sprue into it and turning it into uh, gap filler. Works fantastically well as gap filler. Cannot recommend enough. Five stars. That is that is fair. I'm actually... We'll probably turn one of these into sprue goo. Now, are they still... Uh, like, are they still liquid? Or is it to the point where they are, like, just yeah, crusties? Okay. They're still liquid. Like, the, the cement, the white cap, is the, like... It's like at a third. Yep. But I honestly, like, I just haven't had, like, I've tried them on hardcore mini stuff. Uh, another person off of IG, I believe I've shown you, like, the cool, like, one off Black Templar champion guy I've got. Yep. Uh, I tried it on him. Tried it on stuff from Pop Goes the Monkey. Uh, and G Dub Plastic also was so hopeful. I even tried it on K47. Uh, automaton. Wow. Well, it's not going to glue automatons because those are metal, right? I mean, it, it it did work, though. Shouldn't. It did. did. Well, actually, wait. Let me touch the automaton. Yeah, I was going to say, actually go and touch it because those things are a super glue nightmare because... so. You know what? I knocked him over. Yep. And his arms did pop off. But That's, here's the thing. Yep. I glued his legs on. Yeah, so metal to uh metal to metal is pretty much you're stuck with super glue unless you're actually gonna solder the joints. Wow. Come yeah. on, autofocus. There we go. Um yeah, metal to metal, you're pretty much stuck with super glue. Um if you're doing uh you can also the the one that I've heard is the most successful in this particular arena with like metal to metal connections. Um, I've always heard that you can do um, green stuff and then super glue as, as a decent means of, of collecting. Uh, I have tried that. Um, I don't like that method. It is, while it does work, the minis are incredibly brittle still. Like yeah, they tip over once and they shatter. Yeah, and super glue is always going to kind of be that way. Like that is the issue with super glue. Um, I've also heard people having success with baking soda in super glue, and I can attest that that does work. Like out of the automatons that I managed to actually keep together, those are the only ones that stayed together for any amount of time. But uh, yeah, good luck with that. There's a reason I don't do K47. It's because my favorite faction is a giant pain in the dick to to model. So. If I'm not yep. going to accept the amount of uh, penis pain that is required to assemble, I'm going to move on to a different series of models because mm -hmm. life is short. So now that I've sort of got uh, loose sketches on here, I'm going to do some refining of, of the shape of our highlight. Um, you guys can already see on stream that I'm starting to take care of that. I'm not saying that this is final shape. Um, but I am going to start to refine what I've got on there. So you can see, I'm going to start with this 
like I'll, I'll do one pad at a time. Now that I've kind of got a path that, of the light that I'm sort of happy with, I'm not quite there yet, but we're getting close. Um, once I've sort of got like a sketched out path of where the light is going, um, I'm going to start doing it one bit at a time and I'll stop and reflect and look at how, you know, everything is looking, whether the light seems coherent or whether I'm placing things in the wrong spot or, or what have you. Um, now that I look at this again, I am totally unhappy with where that light is. So uh, we paint over it and we start over again. But that is the blessing of doing this in a thousand very light coats is I don't like where how something is rendering out. Cool. Uh, I paint over it and wait for it to dry and then start over again. This is this is always um, well, at least in most of my painting career, this has been the bane of my existence is I want to get it either correct or nearly correct way too early in the process. And I'm unwilling, I was always unwilling to kind of go back and be like, no dummy, that looks bad. Just repaint it. Um, Cause you know, I, I watched Duncan and praise Duncan. Duncan was always like, okay, you put the, you know, corn red here and you put the Wazdak red on top of it. And then you're done, right? Like you put a wash on it, maybe come back with some Wazdak and it's over. And I really just want uh, part of the purpose of the stream is to show people like, no, don't don't think that things are going to be perfect the first time because they're not. They never are. Never have been. <laughs> Those guys have been painting for, you know, in Duncan's case, he was painting for uh, heavy metal for like 14 years before Warhammer TV started. Yep, And before like, that, <clears throat> he just painted the hobby. Yeah, like, it's one of those things, like, before he was ever on the team, he was, you know, just a hobbyist teenager. Although, Duncan does still look like he's, like, 12 years old some days, so, I don't know. Not trying to knock on the guy, the dude is the reason I actually got into the hobby. Like, let's be serious. Uh, Warhammer TV was the thing that turned me from a guy who was like, Warhammer models sure do look cool, to being like, I can do that. Hell yeah. Like, this seems... This seems about my speed, uh, and I just, no, no knock against, you know, Warhammer TV and the whole, like, heavy metal system of edge highlighting and all the rest of it. It's just, there are, is more to this hobby than what they probably show, because they want to sell you more GW stuff. Not that they're wrong, like, they can sell you all GW stuff all day long, that's fine, but, like, I guess I wanted to come on here and be like, this is my style. My style involves making a mess of things and refining shape and refining light patterns and all the rest of it many times because that's life like that's i don't i don't know man have you do you watch any live streamers or do you watch any youtube painting videos um i have it's not like any live painting i i i watch battle streamers i watch talk no, I don't actually, I've never watched a live text talks because I don't know if he does them live. I think they're all pre-recorded, but I have watched Scrambles, the Mech Warrior, a few of those. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to Tex about Scotch and uh, FNFALs because, well, he's from Tex, so it kind of just happened. Yeah, that's but fair. He's a super rad guy, interacts with a lot of people. That's fair. So yeah, uh, just Continuing to work more and more light. Um, now, I should talk a little bit about why I'm using the colors that I'm using. So why are we using abyssal blue and graphite instead of using black? Um, or And why are we using yellow and white sand? Uh, Tenere yellow and white sand instead of using like white? Um, part of the reason is uh, black is real boring. Straight up. <laughs> it's just real boring. <laughs> But also, it's you can you can get yourself really into trouble with black pretty quickly um, because black and pure black, um, it's really hard to highlight because the midtone is also your shadow, and that means that your highlights have to either be uh, an off white color, which can look cool. Like there's nothing wrong with like throwing down, uh, you know, like a blue or a pink or white or whatever you know tint of off white you want to throw on it. 
but it's really hard to keep that as a cogent highlight and shadow color throughout the model. So you'll notice not just today as I put the paint on this little part of it and, and sort of get more of his armor done. Um, but as we do this whole model, I'm going to use that combination of Abyssal Blue as our shadow color and then Tenere Yellow and White Sands as our highlight colors. That'll happen throughout the model. And the reason why we're going with those on our color palette is because they're not quite uh, compl split com or complementary colors to each other, but they're pretty close. Um, and they're both pretty desaturated, right? <clears throat> yeah, I have a, a love-hate relationship with painting black. Actually, yeah, I, I prefer painting white over black, which is... You are the odd one out on that, my friend. I, I do. Yeah. Though, I mean, okay, I didn't enjoy painting white until I got an air. Yeah, that's totally fair. And and painting white with a brush brush, like, by hand, is not easy. Don't let anybody ever tell you that it is. Um, I still it's struggle hard. with white on a brush. Um, if you thin it down too much, it, it almost immediately becomes chalky. Uh, if you keep it at full strength and just sort of blast away with it, it's really hard to highlight. Um, yeah. Citadel it doesn't own a good white mix because they refuse to just use a finely ground white titanium white pigment because they're expensive. So it's just one of those things. Um, not easy. It ain't easy being cheesy. So... Adam, where lurkers can just keep lurking. I want them to not. Well, I want it. I want someone to be active in chat. Be active like Sean in chat, guys. Or don't be active like Sean in chat and, and just do you. We appreciate you guys hanging out. So if you guys have any tips on how you guys like to paint, you know, white, paint black, what your favorite color is. We're just continuing to work through on our Citadel. So again, I'm using Citadel. Um, for our mid-tone is graphite gray. Uh, we're using our shadow tone over here on the palette. This is our shadow tone. This is abyssal blue. And then for our highlight, we're using a combination. Uh, this is white sands. And then we got a little tenary yellow in there that we're, we're using both of them combined to make a kind of desaturated white yellow. And we're using those together because um, I'll show you. It covers fairly well. Uh, if we look on my thumb here uh, as it dries, the pigment doesn't drop out of it, which is something that I really like in white light colors uh, and is uncommon to find in a lot of whites until you get into like really nice acrylics. And by really nice acrylics, I sometimes mean Citadel, but not all of their stuff is super nice. Um, generally, I'm talking about like golden titanium white or t uh, golden zinc white if, if, if you're, you know, if you're willing to accept that bluishness into it. Um, but yeah. Throw your tips in chat for how to how to paint white better. Or black, really. I mean you could you could cheat like Steve did and uh not paint it either of those colors? Yes. Yeah, so I'm using the hues here. Like I'm using our 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 mid-tone is graphene and graphene is a very very neutral dark uh dark gray um it doesn't have a whole lot of color to it it's slightly blue but not overly it looks a little bit more blue on the palette just because i got that yellow there and then the abyssal blue here is obviously it's a very very dark desaturated blue color um, we're using these colors in combination just just to give us a little bit more um interest to the model now, I could be using black on this, and I probably will in parts of this model end up using black. I don't think we'll use it all the way across the model. It's going to be very deep shadows and stuff like that that end up being black. But otherwise, we're going to mostly stick to this, you know, weird highlighting scheme to give our model some coherency and a, cut, uh, a look across the model that sort of speaks to um, how this model looks. Now, now's a good time for me to start talking a little bit about how light renders on different models. And I'm going to just give me two seconds. I'm going to keep talking while I slowly shift myself away because I forgot to grab our friends. 
Honky Tonk, the Orcs of Learning. Yeah, Honky Tonk. Yeah, so Honk and Tonk are the Orcs of Learning because we have both of these guys are painted in the exact same base coat. So both of these were painted with Black 2.0. Um, Black 2.0, for those who don't know, is a very, very matte uh, finish. Like it has an extremely matte pigment and an extremely matte medium in it. Um, and then I just took Honk and or Tonk here and, and I covered them over with gloss varnish. So we are using the same model here in both cases so that we can illustrate a little bit how light works. Um, on our matte surface here, you can see that the light is fairly diffuse and that there's no real hot spot on it. Like it never gets to a white. Uh, at best, you're gonna see some slight, like mid grays in there. And that's about as hot as we get with it. When we look at uh, Honk and or Tonk here, um, he is glossy, just straight up glossy. This is a couple of coats actually of just, um, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's Liquitex glass uh, varnish. And you can see that uh, I've got two lights going on on here. So you can see both of those lights reflecting. Uh, if I can get a flat enough surface here, you should be able to see both of the lights. Eh, not quite, but um, you can see that the lights that are on here are reflecting the daylight color that I'm using out of the bulbs right now. Well, corrected daylight color that I'm using out of the bulbs. Um, and, and it comes back almost white into the camera. Um, it comes back very, very luminous, very, very hot. And that's something that we're going to have to deal with on this model. So when we start thinking about like, what is the material that this is made out of? Um, that's going to be a part of it. So we know that these by our test model, these shoulder pads or these arm pads, uh, what are those bracers? On um, which part of the arm? Forearm. Forearm, that would be a bracer or a goblet. It's, oh, it's just the forearm, right? Just no a hand. forearm, no hand. That is a bracer. So we've decided on on our test model here that that is a matte surface. So you can see I've got a pretty high highlight on there. So we're gonna try and work around that. Like we're gonna say, okay, if that is our absolute highest color, now that we have built that to, you know, that, that pretty saturated yellowy white color, we can bring that back. Like we don't have to say that, okay, well, uh, I made a mess. It's too bright now. Nothing can ever work from there. Nah, we're actually just going to work it the other way because that's what you do. Um, painting is a back and forth process as we decide materials, as we decide lighting condition and all the rest of it. We're going to make choices on the model. And I really do believe um, if you're thinning your paints properly, you're never going to get to a point where you can't add or remove detail still by just another thin coat of paint, right? Even if it takes, you know, a bunch of them for coverage and whatnot, you can always, always, always come back to your model and just add some more paint onto the model. Now, if you if you're making mistakes like crazy, cool. Just consider that model a learning model. Like, don't don't get down on yourself. Don't don't feel bad about things. Say like, hey, this is a cool learning experience. I'm gonna get the next one. If you get to the point where you've got so much paint on the model that you can't paint it anymore? Well, cool. That Ooh. model doesn't owe you anything. It did its job. You learned some stuff. Next model is going to be cooler. But yeah, I now, I, oh, go ahead. I have, um, if Sean is on stream, which I don't think he is because he usually is blowing up the chat with his uh, inane babble. Um, but when he does get on stream, I will bring it up again. Um, but when, we first got in into the hobby. I um, customized a Space Wolf hero. Like, if there was a weapon I wanted him to have, he had it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was new to the hobby, so I used an excess amount of glue. Um, but we started calling, like, the excess... Like, putting... Making a model too busy. Uh, we started calling it Conaning it because we nicknamed that the mini I first built Conan. Uh, despite him having been dismantled, his entire left arm still survives because there's so much glue on it that it's unbreakable. Neat. Yeah, and um, I did the same thing. Like, I have plenty of models where I slipped up with the amount of glue or, you know, I just painted things too brightly or I just, like, was too thick with paint. Like, I wasn't listening to our Lord and Savior, Duncan, uh, 
and, and wasn't, you know, thinning my paints appropriately. And it just so happened that, like, all right, detail gets clogged. Or I was, you know, uh, priming with a rattle can, and I just kept my finger on the trigger a second too long, and okay. He doesn't have a face anymore. All right, I was still going to paint that mini. Like... So, um, you guys can see I'm still refining shape. And now that we've sort of got a shape, right? We sort of got that feel. Let's let's take a look at the Orc of Learning. Let's take a look at his pad. And you can see just how little change, like how little lumosity change works there, right? And now that we've got sort of an identified spot for all of our, our highlights and shadows, cool. We're going to go in with our desaturated colors. So this is, this is our... Uh, Graphene gray once again, a little bit of abyssal blue, but we mostly want to be using graphene at this point in time. So you guys can see sort of, and that lick, that mix is pretty liquid, right? And we're just pulling away from our highlights. We're going to overrun our highlights pretty thoroughly there, but we're always pushing towards our shadow areas. So when I'm trying to, you know, smooth out a blend like this, I'm t pulling from where we don't want paint to where we want paint to accumulate. And that just having that in mind, where we want paint to accumulate, because every time you pick up the brush and, and I'll try and get nice and close to this, um, let's do it on another spot of them. So let's go grab some more paint off the palette um, where I want paint to accumulate. So I know that on, even though this doesn't make much sense in reality, um, I'm going to do a little bit of a highlight along this edge. As I'm picking up my brush towards the end of that stroke, there's a there's a perfect example. Let's see if we can get that on camera. Um, as I'm pulling up my brush at the end of the stroke, you guys can see there's like a little puddle of paint that ends up there. No matter how smooth you are with, with picking up the brush, that puddle of paint always is there. That's just a matter of how water works, well, how fluid works, period. Um, surface tension. Like substances want to join together. That's why they form a liquid. Um, it will always pull that. There will always be that puddle, no matter how careful you are with your stroke, no matter how controlled you are, it's always gonna make that little puddle at the end. So just work with that puddle. Make that puddle be the place where you want it to be, as opposed to trying to struggle against it. So if I start over there on the highlight and I want a dark area to be in the middle there, again, I'm just doing that same thing. I'm just pulling towards where I want the paint to accumulate. And this is, it's an advanced technique, but it's something that like, it's just practicing brush control really is all that that is. It's not some secret technique or anything like it's just practicing brush control. You're just, once you've got it so that you are painting and the like actual tip of your brush is going where you want it to, or your brush is going where you want it to, which takes a little while to develop that skill. Don't, don't ever feel like if the brush is still moving around and hopping around on you that you suck. Just a skill that takes time to develop. But um, being conscious of the direction of your stroke and where you're beginning and ending that stroke is also a part of, you know, getting better at that part of the hobby. Like it, it's, it's, it's an inescapable part of the hobby is eventually learning not just brush control, but planning where your strokes are going. All right. So we're getting closer with this pad. Um, again, to take out the Orc of Learning. Just looking at the two of them, we can already see that on this pad, we've got way more interest going on, right? Now, there's little bits to clean up and stuff still. we still got lots of stuff to, to continue blending down so that it reads as black, because right now we're reading as, you know, sort of somewhere between navy and, and gray, like a desaturated navy. We're going to now start bringing in black, and now is the time where we would start to, because with the majority of this, we're going to use black to sort of make sure that this equipment looks like it's black. So I'm going to continue to work that blend up over on that part of his or his bracer. That side of his bracer, just continuing to work that blend in. And I might go back like I, I'm thinking right now, I'm like, I kind of like where this is or how, how we've got a little bit of a highlight there. That makes sense to me. 
I also want to put a little bit of a highlight over here just based off of the actual shape. And some of this I'm just making up shape too. Like some of this, uh, some of what I'm doing with the paint isn't just following along with what was in the in the actual GW sculpt. Some of this I'm actually adding a little bit of shape to the sculpt because uh, it makes the thing more interesting. So again, I'm coming with a little bit of a brighter color here, not much brighter and pretty thin. And I'm just gonna keep reinforcing these sorts of points of interest where I think we can make a little bit cooler shape on this model. I'm not gonna do a ton of it, but where I think it is appropriate, I am gonna just pull that stuff out so that we we look like. Sorry, I'm also adjusting this to look at it in in alignment with my eyes because I'm trying to paint for the camera right now. Uh, but I every once in a while I need to check like does that look right if I look at it in the light for me. Oh, I hit him. So much painting. So much painting. I just found a really cool concept. Uh, uh, art of a space marine. Oh yeah? It is the Winter Astartes. Oh nice! It's the winter, winter Soldier themed space marine. Cool. Silver arms I'm assuming? Uh, one silver arm. That that makes sense. Um, But instead of a chest eagle, it's the Hydra symbol. That feels less good. Yeah, I mean... I mean, I'm not gonna knock it. Like, that is that is the Winter Soldier after all, but like... You know, I haven't, I still haven't watched any of the new Marvel TV. I haven't watched any of Falcon and Winter Soldier. I didn't watch any of uh, WandaVision. Not that I don't want to, I just, I've been busy. And like when I'm going to bed is the last time in my life I want to watch new TV. No, that's, that's totally fair. Um, it's, it's just, I, I want to get there, but I want to like, I want to spend I want to I want to take a day right like I want to take my time and be like yeah wash over me that was that was part of the joy of going to like Marvel movies and stuff is we made an event of it like we've cosplayed <coughs> oh man we went as agents of shield the one time <laughs> whose was it uh so we made our own shield badges uh I had level one clearance I was the the peon uh, I think we gave Chris Omega no I had Omega Oh, okay. Chris, Chris, we made Chris basically a janitor. No, no, we made me the janitor. Oh, yeah, you were the janitor. Yeah, I was I was the, the field agent with clearance higher than um, Nick Fury's because I have the Nick Fury uh, Hulk sex tape. Yep. Uh, and then let's see. Kayla also had one. All I remember I is that uh, mine... When you, I think it was, I think it was mine. When you scanned the QR codes that we put on them, uh, mine was for a fifty-five gallon tub of personal lubricant. Yeah, that was yours. Mine was a <clears throat> a very misleading porno that was actually just a dude grocery shopping for like ten minutes. Yep, but it's it's on Pornhub. Or yep. it was. It was on Pornhub. Um, Who knows now? Chris had like, I think Chris's was a bunch of dildos. Oh, it was a multi-pack of dildos. That's what it was. Yes, the, the varying sizes. Yep. Um, I'm trying to remember what else. Kayla's was like a refrigerator or something, if I remember correctly. Hers wasn't... Yeah, I, Kayla's was something. I can't remember what hers was. I mean, I, <coughs> Kayla's... I remember I've known Kayla people. since I was in uh, junior high school, so, like, okay. I love her, but I didn't also want to make hers uh, as disgusting as ours were. Yeah. Ours were no, ours that. were pretty filthy. They were. Yeah. We we did attract a lot of attention. Well, we also were all in matching suits and had earpieces and sunglasses on. <laughs> so we we were, you know, playing the part when we went. Uh, that was for was that Civil War? That was Or was it not, Infinity War? It was Infinity War. There you go. I so, remember because remember we we went to the midnight showing and we decided to drink a bunch of beer beforehand, and then we're like I think you dropped me off at my place at like three o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah, no, that was definitely Infinity War because we were all sad because everybody died, except for uh, nobody died because like everybody had multi-picture deals. Oh, uh, now I miss Chadwick Boseman. 
Yeah. Rest in power, Chad. Quick. I don't know him well enough to call him Chad, but god damn. That's heartbreaking. Do you know that while they were filming all of uh, Infinity War and um, Endgame, Endgame, he he knew he had like he knew he had cancer and was undergoing chemotherapy for like most of it, mm -hmm. which is insanity to keep up that sort of like muscle mass that he had while doing. Like he was Black Panther through and through. Like that is a hell of a fight to be in and to like just keep it going like that. That is. Oh. Yeah, that is... That's some hardcore shit right there. Yeah, man. And, like... Okay. The Black Panther is not my favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. That's fair. Um, But it's definitely in my top five. It is really good. Really, really good. You know, um... Boy, if I was to have to do a top five... MCU movies. I don't know where I would land. Um, I can tell you the one that most people put in that that would not land for me is all of the Spider Men. The new ones, the like Homecoming. Yeah, and... I still think that Spider Man Two is better than either Homecoming or Far From Home. Like. Like Tobey Maguire Spider Man 2 or The Amazing yep. Spider Man 2? No, not The Amazing Spider Man 2. Nobody likes Andrew Garfield except for, well, it's not that oh, it was okay. bad either. It was just. He was a great Spider Man and a really bad Peter Parker. I can agree with that. And, and, and I guess I should. I don't know if I have to defend myself or not, but I will a little bit. Well, I, I just heard um, Jamie scream in, ex, um, in exclamation, so. Andrew Garfield's a great Spider-Man. Andrew Garfield was a great Spider-Man because Spider-Man is quippy and he's got, you know, he's cool and all the all the things that Peter Parker can't be, Spider-Man is. And Spider-Man on or and Andrew Garfield was cool cuz he's Andrew Garfield. Like he's just cool all the he just he's Andrew Garfield. Like he's just bloody cool. I don't know. I, I don't know if I need to justify it any more than that. And watching nope. him pretend to be like nerdy Peter Parker, he was never nerdy Peter Parker. He was just cool Andrew Garfield, and then he became even cooler Spider-Man. So I don't know. Like that was that was sort of my issue with his stuff. Uh, and I just Tom Holland might be an amazing actor, but. Um, have you ever heard of a, a, a podcast called The Weekly Planet? Mm, no. It's a comic book news, comic book TV and movie news podcast that I listen to. It's with a couple of Aussie guys. Um, they're they're great. Uh, at any rate, um, they have a Tom Holland voice that is now what I associate Tom Holland with, and it makes him sound like uh, he may be a three year old child. I guess maybe more than a three-year-old child, like a prepubescent boy. And to be fair, I think that uh, when Tom Holland took the part, he wasn't much beyond that. But like now, whenever I think of Spider-Man, like MCU Spider-Man, I can't help it. He, that's just that's who he is. I don't know. Maybe it's not fair. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not giving. Tom Holland, fair shrift. I, I liked um, uh, the Vulture in the first one. That was great. Oh, that was yeah. Oh man, that was so good. Um, he was he was absolutely like, terrifying. Yeah, he was. Uh, my so far, he was actually my favorite on screen Spider Man bad guy from all of the movies. Uh, I really liked how he was done. He had a really interesting backstory about like how he became the Vulture. Without having to do like the weird pseudo life giving magic version of the vulture. That's fair. Um, I gotta but, say that as far as villain construction, I like Team Mysterio more. Uh, I I'm a little sad that when it came down to the final fight, it was still just and and I'm talking about in Homecoming now. Uh, the yeah. final fight in Homecoming was still just Mysterio versus uh, versus Spider Man or more or less versus Peter Parker. Um, yeah. 
I think that that fight could have got structured slightly differently. It could have been my favorite fight in all of comic books because the mid, uh, the second act, uh, Dark Knight of the Soul. So like the 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 second act when the hero's at his lowest point is when Peter just gets absolutely uh, uh, poop kicked by Mysterio with all of the visions and whatnot and like the confusion. And that is a great scene. And then the final battle is just sort of a letdown from there because I don't feel like it displays Team Mysterio as being Team Mysterio. I think it goes back to relying on a single villain that Peter can just punch to like save the day. And that those are always the most disappointing third acts is that the hero can just punch his way out of the third act and it's fine. Yeah, that okay. I, I do see where you're coming from. Like Tom Holland is my favorite Spider cinematic Spider Man so far. Uh, just because I feel he does a really good job at playing a awkward dorky teenager because he's he was he's an awkward, awkward dorky teenager dorky teenager, <laughs> and he's a pretty pretty quippy Spider Man. Yeah, and and quippy Spider Man is definitely a part of the Spider Man character. Like and. Andrew Garfield was really good at quippy Spider-Man. Um, I noticed how neither of us have talked about Tobey Maguire all that much, and it's because Tobey Maguire was a, like a forty-year-old yeah. um, dude when he was playing it. Like Joe Manganiello was, uh, uh, he was a teenager in Spider-Man One, like supposedly a teenager in Spider-Man One. Joe was like thirty when they filmed that movie. <laughs> like, nope, he's not a high schooler, guys. Like. Joe Manganiello has the body of a 25, 27 year old bodybuilder in that movie. Go back and watch. He's uh, the guy that punches or gets in a fight, fist fight with Peter right after he gets his powers. This is Joe Manganiello oh. punching him. I don't know exactly what scene you're talking about. Yeah, it's Flash Thompson is the like character, but it's Joe Manganiello is like the person. Yeah. And it's just bad. Like it's, it's, demonstrably bad like everybody looks like they're a thousand like no no disrespect to kirsten dunst but she does not look like uh, an 18 year old mary jane or like a 17 year old mary jane she looks like kirsten dunst who's a great actor and like this isn't about the acting it was a casting choice that sam raimi made that was like why sam raimi why did you cast all of the old people to play all of the teenagers why did you cast why? the olds i mean like to be fair Nobody knew how to cast anything at that point in their life, like at that point in time. Like, why? Why yeah, did yeah. why? With the exception, maybe of X Men, uh, none of the comic book movies had good casting. Straight up, none of them. Look at the two abominations that are the Ghost Rider movies. A, a Marvel superhero I actually quite enjoy, and I have never been able to make it through either of those movies. I, I don't think I've even tried. Uh, I'll be straight up. I, I don't think I've even don't. tried to watch those movies. I don't, just don't. Because uh, Nick Cage can do some things okay. Like, Wicker Man, he's okay. But, like, Nick Cage is not my... I, I know that there are people out there that are going to be like, Nick Cage is great. And I'm like, cool. Like, that doesn't take it away from you. I'm not trying to take your enjoyment of Nick Cage away. And I'm not saying... Yeah. For my sensibility... Uh, Nick Cage is a weird, disastrous mess that is best played against guys like Steve Buscemi. Yeah. Con Air is great because Nick Cage and Steve Buscemi are equally weird in that movie. And uh, I guess Steve Buscemi is worse, but like Nick Cage is also. I don't know. Just that movie is weird, man. I, okay. I really enjoy Con Air. That movie is so weird. Like, Agreed. Steve Buscemi is a cannibal. A cannibal who eats a small child, doesn't he? Or does he not eat the small child? I can he never remember. Eat the small child. Okay. I, it, well, it, it's weird because it like you see the small child and him having tea, and then it's just him by himself, and he looks all pleased with himself. But there's also like no blood or anything around, so it's kind of hard to tell. I assume. Um, I always assumed that that was cinema shorthand for "I ate the child," but. Again, yeah, I've been wrong that's before. Fair. Uh, John Malkovich is a psychotic, like mass murderer, like mastermind guy called. 
he was like a I don't know, he was also like a cyber criminal before cyber criminals were like cool or a thing, really. Was he a hacker? So them, I don't know. They called him Cyrus the Virus. Yep, I know. It was listen, there are not many redeeming qualities to that movie, but the way they named characters, absolutely key. Um Cole Meany plays a really dickish DEA agent for some reason it's the DEA. Well, they're being like, prisoner transported on oh on no no air. no he's a, he's a, he's a u.s marshal yeah that's, that's what it what is. He is that makes more sense yeah uh and then oh i can't remember the other guy uh is his new partner and like destroys his pristine uh, reputation no Listen, there's a lot of that movie that i have forgotten yeah that's true like i get like flashes of bits and pieces like just certain scenes which now thinking back to it is basically just the trailer that's fair that is fair you know what else oh, is fair what else is fair the news i was just about to say oh man it's time for the news oh boy okay let's do it news 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 News, 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 news. Oh, we're going to get sued by Disney Music. so hard. <laughs> so, uh, first one that I pulled up, we're doing the fantasy news right now because it's Thursday and fantasy news is fantasy news. Ultima Thule. So, uh, for those of you who were with us on Tuesday, uh, we were talking on Tuesday about uh, a model that Angel Heraldis painted, and I couldn't remember the name of the Kickstarter that it was a part of. Then I remember the name of the Kickstarter, and I was like, well, it just started, so I guess I'll throw it into the news this week. This is Ultima Thule, the Battle of Hyperborea. It's live on Kickstarter right now. I believe that we've got, what, like 20-some-odd days left? Oh, no, there's only 13 hours to go. Get on it. Go and, go and back this now. At any rate, um, I, I actually knew it was ending tonight. But uh, this is a combination between Chimera Models, who uh, Chimera is also a paint maker. They're sculptors and all the rest of it in Arcadia. Um, each of them sort of sculpted one faction. It is all larger size. There are 32 millimeter uh, minis in here, but they are very, very big 32 millimeter minis. Most of this stuff is like uh, 54, 75 millimeter stuff. But I'm down into some 120 stuff. Yeah, uh, you can see this was this was the stuff or this is the model. So uh, Symphony. Uh, this is the one that Anal Horaldez painted that I featured on our Hits on 2 Plus on Tuesday. Um, if you have, you know, things you want to put in Hits on 2 Plus, so any content you come across on the internet, yours or someone else's, you can always send it in to us. Just uh, hit me up. You can DM me on uh, Instagram, just at Choice Minis, or you can always send it to us, choiceminis at gmail.com. But yeah, uh, the sculpts in this are great. Uh, I love the two factions Aww. that they've got going on. So there is uh, one faction is uh, the Romans, the other faction is Norse. Uh, Hyperborea, for those who don't know, is what the ancient Greeks uh, called Iceland when they accidentally found it. And then the Romans, it became a legend. Uh, and they just decided to have basically their mythology fight. So I'm super in. I love these models. They're great. They look really nice. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's one of those things you can hit it up on Kickstarter. And because I finally remembered it now, uh, I decided we should probably talk about it. Just just briefly. No, that is that's fair. Like we we definitely should because like these are nice minis and seeing them and the way they're painted makes me actually not want to get one. Yeah. Um now the good news is is that every time either Chimera or Arcadia has had uh, a Kickstarter, there has always been some sort of post release. You're generally paying like I, I I didn't back the last time they got these guys went to Kickstarter, but it's generally about 30% more when you buy it off their website. And it's always Chimera is always limited run because they pour the resin and all the rest of it. So it is always limited run on their stuff when it's in stock, it's in stock. And then it might be a year before it's in stock once it's out. So just. If you want to save a little bit of money, if you're if you're feeling these models, go on to Kickstarter, it ends uh tomorrow at midnight gmt i believe well tonight at midnight gmt for everybody man that freya model is cool at any rate uh yeah you can you can head over there i'm not gonna back this one i i am saving my shekels uh so that i can someday or schmeckles 
so that I can someday buy. Uh, if you go to Chimera, look up the Apollo model. It is enormous and awesome and 300 bucks. Next newsy news item. I, I labeled this in our in our document. Possibly the weirdest boner. Yeah, there are two uh, new Slanesh. I, I now, I now fully understand why. <laughs> yeah, so there are two new Slanesh demons. These are the uh, talons of Slanesh, and GW. Boy, howdy! The last couple of weeks, they have just been throwing up models that I'm like, okay, well, I guess I won't. I like how they're like. I don't have to eat week. anymore. Like, I love how last week they're like, no new models till May. But hey. Here's new models every day since we said that. Yeah, exactly. So it's <laughs> it is new model Monday. So they are keeping to their promise. You know, on Mondays they that announce new models, and uh, this Mondays just happen to be Slaneshi de uh, Slaneshi demons. Uh, they are twins, as far as I can tell, and, and nobody's actually seen these guys with size references. I'm assuming that these are a little bit smaller than the Keeper of Secrets, which is their big demon uh, right now, but. Man, pretty close as far as size goes and the details on these. Like, I love the Keeper of Secrets. These things on a whole different level. Uh, I know that I am. I, I'm always caught between how much detail GW wants to throw at every model and how I like to paint with big, wide open surfaces so that I can, you know, do smooth blending and stuff like that. But boy, this model, this model, and it is one model. It's just configurable. Um, it's going to be really cool. I, I'd, I'm not going to make a Slanesh army, but if I were, this would definitely be uh, yeah, a definite candidate for, for my centerpiece model. Oh, absolutely. Like, holy smoke. Yeah. Just, are... just the silhouette on this thing is so unmistakable. Like, with the big, like, wing slash cape thing that's going on there. Yeah. Yeah, the winged cape with... Slanesh icon jewels embedded into it in hollows. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate um, just how weird that wing piece is. Great job on making Slanesh weird again. Our favorite hemaphroditic uh, uh, many armed yeah. demons. Yes. Adam, do you ever play KOTOR? Uh, sorry, Knights of the Old Republic? Yes, I have played KOTOR both 1 and 2, to completion, many a time. Want to know what's really cool? It's coming out again after a remaster! Yeah, so it sounds like they, uh, whether or not this is official, uh, it sounds like Aspire, Aspire uh, is actually going to be taking on, so Aspire has done a bunch of work with uh, Republic Commando, like porting Republic Commandos and Jedi Knight to Jedi Outcast. Both of those got ported to PS5 slash Xbox One SX. S slash X, like one or the other. Um, yeah. But yeah, they, they're they both getting ported to current gen consoles. And then the next one that they're contracted for, it sounds like is going to be Aspire's working on KOTOR. So we're finally going to get a, an HD version of Knights of the Old Republic, which I can tell you I have wasted probably hundreds of hours playing. Uh, not oh, just in the first playthrough, because... I don't know. It felt like for 20 years, that was the only Star Wars game. It did. It, it did feel like it was that one. KOTOR 2 and the old Battlefront 2 were like the only two Star Wars games that were worth playing for years. Yeah, man. Yeah. And it, it I mean, we're spoiled now, even though EA isn't the greatest publisher. At least they're actually. Yeah, they I... did something for a little while. And now Disney is spreading that license around. So it sounds like there is a bunch of Star Wars games in the works. And I know some people will argue with me that Star Wars is sci-fi because space. But I'm going to go with Star Wars is fantasy because wizards. At me. Um, at Choice Minis uh, on on Google. Uh, or sorry, on, on uh, basically everything. You can, I don't care. Come on. Have a fight with me on Twitter. Let's have a fight on Twitter. Let's do it. I'm going to call Star Wars a science fantasy op. Boo! With your middle of the roading reasonable bullshit. Boo, I Fine. say. Boo. It is some sort of operatic inspir... I don't know. It's, it's fucking... It's Star Wars. It's amazing. 
it is Star Wars and it is amazing. So I, I'm I'm totally totally down with whatever you guys want to say it is. But in my mind, I always categorize it as fantasy because. But if I had to pick Star Wars and Star Trek, that would be honestly one of the hardest things that I ever have to do. Star Wars or or Star Wars or Star Trek? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I wouldn't want right. to. I like both. I, I, they both have their I, high I, points. They both have their episode twos. Yeah. Or well, in this case, it's the motion picture versus episode two. Yeah, that's true. So, Adam, if you were to guess without looking at the doc, the uh, Game of Thrones spin offs would you assume are in production currently? Without looking at the doc? Yeah. Six, because I read the doc and I remember what it said. <laughs> Cheating son of a bitch. Yeah, there are still six Game of Thrones spinoffs in some form of production right now. Yeah. I think the first one that's coming out is going to be the, the House of the Dragon. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I fell down um, a rabbit hole last week. We, we talked a little bit during the fantasy segment about, you know, uh, what exactly you know who was doing what and and what 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 was going where and how much amazon was spending the insane amount of money that amazon is spending uh bringing lord of the rings to life again but i i don't know how at&t is going to outspend amazon on this one uh at&t parent company of hbo excuse me parent company of hbo has six different series currently in development. They've already canceled four other series, one of which got to pilot. Uh, this is insanity. So the, the, the series that are currently in production, uh, I'm going to do them in sort of chronological order. So starting with the oldest and possibly to the one that is newest in his in the history of Westeros. So uh, there's Nymeria, Nymeria uh, the namesake yeah. of Arya's direwolf, but also... Nymeria was the face who launched 10,000 ships, which is sort of a, analogous to um, Cleopatra, right? Like, is Cleopatra mm -hmm. the face that launched 1,000 ships in our history? So um, there is, like, one reference to it, and it talks about it in terms of, like, super ancient times. I even went back into my books and looked, and it is literally one sentence. So I don't know how much we're, more we're going to get to learn about Nymeria, the warrior queen. So... Uh, I and I read the little blurb about it, and it's um oh, it's a working title for the project. Yeah, the working title for the project is Ten Thousand Ships. So that yeah. is most people are assuming it is about Nymeria, whether it's actually called Nymeria or not. That is the working title that yeah, uh, production is under right now. So Yeah. Uh, up next, you already talked a little bit about it, but House of the Dragon is probably the one that's closest to actually being done or going into the next round of, of pilots. So yeah. House of the Dragon is the one that is... Um, so there is a book for this one. It's George R. R. Martin wrote the book Fire and Blood, uh, which is a prequel to the A Song of Ice and Fire trilogy. I haven't read it. Um, but I do like George R. R. Martin's writing. Um, I don't ever want to talk about, you know, we're never going to get the, 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 the whatever. Um, I liked, and actually, not books. oh, wow. Uh, George Martin, uh, as weird as this is going to sound, I like him more as a sci-fi author than I do as a fantasy author. And um, I liked I, the first three books of A Song of Ice and Fire a lot. So his short uh, stories, if you ever want to read some really weird fiction, uh, called uh, what is it? Flying Aces. Yeah, I, I have volume one. It's amazing. Yeah, it's great. It was um, so good. Yeah, it's just about people who get random mutations. At any rate, um, yeah, House of Dragons probably the one that's furthest along. The one after that. Um, now, okay, and I should say this as much as I didn't want to talk too much about the books. Um, George Martin has said that he will not start working on House of Dragons because he is still tagged in as the executive producer. He's not going to start work on House of Dragons until he is done writing Winds of Winter, which is the next book in the series. OK, cool. Uh, I look forward to reading that book when it eventually comes out. I, I look forward to reading A Dream of Spring when it eventually comes out. That's all I need to say about that, because he's an actual <laughs> man. And whenever he's done, I'm happy to read his work. Yep. So. Um, after House of Dragons, we have Nine Voyages, which is probably around the same time because the rumored 
uh, protagonist or POV of Nine Voyages is Valerian, who is also in House of Dragons. So that's probably going to be where that crosses over. I'm actually really, really excited for after having read it. Yeah, so he is a cool dude, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how they expand out on some of Valerian's characterization. Uh, just, I'm I'm interested to see. He is known as the Sea Snake, or uh, what is it, the Lord of Tides. So yeah, and the head of House Valerian. Yeah. Um, the next one, probably in chronological order after that, is going to be the Tales of Duncan Egg, which. Uh, I'll be the first one to point out. Okay, so we'll talk about what it's about first. Uh, it's the hedge knight who eventually becomes the uh, the 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 head of the king's guard, uh, Dunk, and his squire Egg or Egon Targaryen. For those of you who have read the books or watched the series, Egon Targaryen is the one that uh, Maester, uh, what's his name, the guy at Winter, uh, not at Winterfell, at um... King's Landing. No, the Black Brothers. Um, oh, um, Night's Watch. He's he's the master of the Night's Watch. This is his brother. Aegon yeah. Targaryen. This Aegon Targaryen is that guy's brother. So they do reference him a little bit in the actual like TV series and in the books. Um, but yeah, that's who Duncan Agar. There's a couple of short stories and I, and I remember reading one of them. And okay, it was it was a thing. Cool. I don't remember much about it. It didn't stick out to me. Uh, I think I read it in a compendium somewhere or maybe just on the internet. So maybe I wasn't reading the real version of it, but like, whatever. It was it was a story. I'm interested to hear more in this land and of these tales and cool. Um, the next one in line is Flea Bottom. Uh, there is almost nothing out there. Every you guys can see on screen. This is the Hollywood Reporter caption. Almost everybody's got about as much information on this one. This is one that is definitely the one that is furthest from going into production. But everybody's um, saying that it is supposed to sort of fill out uh, Flea Bottom, which is it's the neighborhood that Davos is from uh, and Gendry hides in. So Davos Seaworth. Um, yeah. Sir Davos Seaworth. Yeah, sorry. Sir Davos Seaworth and King Gendry, if we really want to get into it. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, about King's yeah. Landing. It's about poor people. I, cool. Uh, there's a lot of ways that they could go with this. Like they could just be, you know, like more real world down to earth. But what I'm really hoping for Flea Bottom is that it's actually just Cheers. It's Cheers yeah. in Fantasy Wonderland. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. I know that that's silly and I don't think that HBO would make that TV show, but that's what I want. Fantasy Cheers or like Fantasy Fraser, one or the other. I could get behind Fantasy Cheers. Yeah, right? Like, this is the thing is everybody always, like, with genre TV, everybody is always so strict with, oh, we're doing genre TV. It's got to, like, feel like the actual. No, it doesn't. Be stupid with it. Like, just treat it like a backdrop. Maybe that's what I appreciate most about uh, uh, what Matt Groening's fantasy one. Uh, the the new one that's Netflix only. Um, Ever after? Enchanted? No, Enchanted. There we go. Yeah, thank Unenchanted. you. Yeah, Disenchanted. There we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I like about Disenchanted. It's still just a Matt Groening story that happens to take like it's a Matt Groening project that happens to take place in a fantasy world. If you really think about it too much, none of the like actual story beats make any sense that they are in a fantasy world. But whatever, it's like a sitcommy family whatever in. Fantasy land. I love it because yep. it doesn't it doesn't matter that it's in fantasy. It could be anywhere. Anyway, uh, and then the yeah, the one that is maybe actually not a project, but everybody is reporting is they don't even have an animated style chosen for this supposed animated Game of Thrones drama series. You know what animation style I miss? What's that? Is, do you remember like the late 90s like almost disney or like fox cartoon style animation oh yeah 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 i, I miss that style of animation like not the nickelodeon black... style but like fox had no. uh yeah. yeah like the men in black cartoon the godzilla cartoon big yeah. guy and rusty like stuff like that like i miss that style of animation so much yeah man. i'm glad that I, have, I go to websites where i can watch watch those old cartoons 
if, if there was is amazing yeah if there was an animation style that i would love to see this in that they will never do it'd be uh cheaply produced uh korean colored 1980s hercules Herc, 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 Herc. Yep, yep, that one. That was uh, the, again. The power room. Every every stupid yeah. Every episode is only eight minutes long, and six of those eight minutes are reused in every other episode because it is just horribly produced. If you haven't seen the nineteen, I don't even want to say eighties. It was eighties when I watched it, but it feels like it was made in like the sixties. Maybe I don't know. But if you ever get a chance, go and watch it. It's all on YouTube. It is awful. Absolutely dreadful. But if you want to waste a half hour of your life to watch every single episode of it, it's all out there. You can just YouTube that. Yep. It's bad. Um, I mean, it's so old that my my seven-year-old dad has watched all of it. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a long watch. I thought as no, a kid it like, went on forever. But yeah, it's like mm -hmm. nine episodes or something dumb like that. Is it only nine episodes? It is way fewer than you think. Wow. Right? And then uh, just, just to contrast that, yeah, to contrast that, uh, there are only two seasons of Inspector Gadget. Guess how many episodes of Inspector Gadget there are? Hundreds. Uh, yeah, there's almost 200 of them. There were 100 episode orders. So, yep. Actually, yeah. Um, look at... Look at um the gargoyles tv show oh yeah first first season 24 episodes pretty standard second season 70 like five episodes yeah third season 24 episodes like the second season just went on and on but it was also has like it's the journey to avalon and the journey back and oh yeah like, but that was the third season What's yeah back in those season? Yeah, back in those days, uh, animation production was done a lot differently than live TV, so they would order big sets. So unlike, you know, modern days where Rick and Morty gets renewed for 24 episodes at a time or whatever it is, um, they would they would run a season and if it got picked up. So uh, I'm thinking like He-Man and She-Ra, uh, they would run eight episodes and if and they would run just a ton of stuff like there are. I'm sure there are lost cartoons from that sort of like 80s era where they would run like six to ten episodes. Uh, and then if it got picked up, they would pick up 100 episodes. Like, He-Man and She-Ra was a package deal. They picked up He-Man after eight episodes, I think, on the original order, and then produced, like, 45 more of them. And then they just released them slowly over Saturday mornings. Like, there was no, like, it gonna come out once a week or whatever, because they were like, whatever, it's kids, they don't care, they don't, they'll never know. So, yeah. Um, we can, I, I want to talk briefly about some of the ones that we definitely know are done. Um, and I'm happy that at least one of these is definitely done. Uh, the Long Night, which is basically, uh, so, you know, in, have you, you've watched all of Game of Thrones, right? Oh, yeah. Heavy yeah. spoilers for Game of Thrones. In season eight, you know, the guy that's in the middle of the, like, Children of the Forest's big, like, design and gets turned into the first White Walker? They, yeah. like, stab him in the chest with a crystal mm -hmm. and stuff? That is set in the period of the Long Night. That is the Age of Heroes. So this series was basically because of how George R. R. Martin conceives of his universe being a cyclical time universe, which if you didn't know, now you know. Um, it's a cyclical time universe. So they were basically going to get to play all of Game of Thrones again, except for do it like thousands of years beforehand. It's stupid. I hate it and I didn't want it to ever come into doing because like, Okay, so you're going to have different people basically do the same thing over again. Wop, wop. Wop, wop. Yeah. Can, can, hey. canceled. It's like all of the Saw movies are all the same movie. Yeah, the one thing that I will say is um, I understand why they went to this one first. I'm glad that they didn't decide to proceed with it. I, I feel bad for all the people who worked on it that, you know, it didn't get picked up. Especially knowing that D&D's uh, first shot at this, uh, Benioff and whatever his name is, the two Daves who ran, who were the showrunners for this uh, Game of Thrones TV series, their pilot got 90% reshot because it was quote unquote unwatchable the first time. So, um, wow. 
even George Martin said it was unwatchable, and he is pretty pro the D D series, like the the Game of Thrones TV series. So, yep. Yeah. Um, there were also a bunch of unnamed projects that got canceled. That uh, fine. Hey, well, uh, we're kind of on like oh, yeah. fantasy TV shows and D and D. Do we know when the Critical Role role show is going to come out? The cartoon. Uh, they're still, I believe it's still in process for animation. Pre-production? No, they got through pre-production, and I think that they've started to lay down some of the soundtrack and stuff, like some of the voice tracks, but I think after that we're going into animation, so uh, oh, okay. I wouldn't expect it anytime soon. I I'm sure it's still probably a year or two away. Yeah, I was thinking, it I just hadn't heard anything about it for, for a while. Yeah, it, if you happen to know where they are at, because I don't follow Critical Role all that closely, if you happen to know, throw it up in chat. Tell Adam and I we're wrong, because um, it won't be the first time I've been wrong. Uh, just, any... That is, like, the greatest Kickstarter of all time. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that everybody's really happy with where that project is headed. I'm glad that they picked up distribution through Amazon, so it means that I'll be able to watch it. Um, yeah. Out of the cancelled projects for uh, Game of Thrones, Brian Hedgeland, which was LA Confidential, a movie I liked, uh, Ma Max Brod Bordenstein, which was Godzilla. Um, that is not Godzilla King of the Monsters, that was Godzilla 2000. And uh, Carly Rae uh, of Mad Men all had shows that got somewhere in pre-production and then were cancelled, so, you know. That's that's four so far. Uh, and then, of course, there was a really public announcement between Series 7 and Series 8 of Game of Thrones that D&D, &D, uh, David and David, were getting their own spinoff series. No one's talked about it, but they are not doing that series anymore. They also lost their Star Wars series. And um, Game of Thrones Season 8 was so bad... I don't know if I would trust them to do anything else. Yeah, no, that is fair. Game of Thrones season eight was uh, an atrocious way to end that series. The whole Listen, season. Yeah, uh, just I don't want to slag on the people who worked on that season, but like there was a lack of direction there once they got in front of the books that was unmistakable. Like. The second that they ran out of books for to to crib from from George R. R. Martin, they were lost. Somewhere around season five, when they ran out of bo books to 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 pull from, it did not did not get better. Um, now we are at what eleven projects or so that have been announced, and some of them are still in production. I have to say that this fact. this all of this still feels very DC uh, EU to me, like very. Think of how many movies DC has announced in the last five years, ten years since they started. Like, since Man of Steel, I guess. How many DC movies do you remember having been announced at some point in time? Oh, so many versus how many actually get made. Right? right? Uh, uh, I'm going to mess around this, with... Right now, DC, like, whatever you want to call their movies. Yeah. They need to slow down like not not slow down making the movies but they're trying to rush their storyline too much and well they've actually abandoned the dceu entirely so there is no longer a shared universe between their movies uh it ended oh. with justice league was the one that uh when jeff johns was no longer the head of production for uh dc and that's that's fine i mean uh, it's it's a little sad that we never got to see a Justice League with Shazam in it. It's a little sad that, you know, like, we didn't ever really get a, a good representation of Martian Manhunter, who happens to be my favorite DC hero. Um, but, you know what? They don't need to be Marvel. Like, they nobody else no. needs to do that. Marvel is doing it, and they're going to keep doing it until literally Disney uh, runs out of money to print. So I don't know. I'm just happy that they're 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 happy. I'm happy that I mean, they're. Okay. I I did watch the trailer for the, the I guess it's the second Suicide Squad movie, but it's just called the Suicide Squad because I think they're going with like the Fast and Furious naming trend, and sure. they're gonna think we don't notice. Um, 
And I like James Gunn as a as a movie maker. He's the guy who's From what helming. I can tell, uh, they look a lot more comic accurate and behave a lot more comic accurate. Accurate. Yeah. Um, but the trailer was good. I, I enjoy the trailer. I might not go see it in theaters, but I will definitely watch it. Yeah, I um, uh, I waffle on this because I like James Gunn. Uh, I think that he makes interesting movies. I, I wasn't a huge fan. To come back to a prior topic, I wasn't a huge fan of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. So it probably wouldn't show up on my top five. Uh, you know, if we want to talk about top five movies in the MCU, uh, I'm not sure that that would be in my top five. But definitely uh, no, the Guardians, first one, Guardians. Guardians 1 actually might be, though. Guardians 1 is definitely in my top five. Yeah, to me, it's it sort of depends because my top, like the number one in the MCU, like in all of the MCU, to me yeah. is still um, Captain America Winter Soldier. Yep, that's my favorite one. That is, it's so good. I you know, like. I have a hard time explaining why. I uh, spy really... thriller. I just love that they cross yeah. genre spy thriller into a superhero movie. And that was the first time that they started really experimenting with uh, not superhero as the genre of the film, but really branching uh, the MCU out to encompass <laughs> other directions, right? They sort of did it a little bit with Thor the Dark Thor, but they didn't have a good fantasy grip on what they were doing with Thor the Dark Thor. And yeah, too much of Thor the fair. Dark Thor was about um setting up infinity stones yes um but, yeah i don't like, know other ones uh, that are in the top five for me is definitely the first avengers just because um how could it not be right which one sorry you cut out there for me oh sorry bit. the first avengers was definitely oh yeah the first avengers so be Winter Soldier, First Avengers, Guardians, the first one. Yeah, I'm not um, even sure that Guardians, the first one, makes it into my top five. Like, it's up there. It's definitely up there. Like, I don't want to say that it's not a contender. I just don't know if it is in the top five. Let's see, what else do we got? Oh, Doctor Strange for me is in the top five. And I know that not everybody is going to uh, agree with that one. Uh, again, I, personal I love opinion Doctor time. Strange. That I really, really enjoyed watching that movie. I love Doctor Strange because the third act fight is exactly the opposite of every other Star Wars or every other MCU movie. And what I mean by the 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 third act fight, so all MCU movies end in pretty much the same way. Like they all have, um, they're very classic as far as three act structure. Um, the third act is always the hero believing in himself and going on to take the big bad evil guy in order to win. And it's normally some sort of giant punch up and the, the hero solves it with punching. And literally the third act structure of, of, of Doctor Strange is Doctor Strange shows up and all of the punching has already happened and the world is over. Like he shows up and he's like, oops, we're too late. We totally messed this up. So he uses his brain and uses the time zone and he can't just use his MacGuffin. Like that's the thing about this movie. It, it plays a lot with time and the theme of time is very evident throughout. And then at the end, even that isn't the solution. Like this MacGuffin, the, the having the eye of Agamotto that has the time zone in the middle of it, isn't the thing that solves it for him. He still has to go and beat Dormammu. And the only way that he beats Dormammu is because he is smart. He can't punch his way to killing Dormammu. He can't magic his way out of it. And they show it in that montage. He tries everything he can and he has to smart his way out of it. And it's the only MCU movie where that happens, where it rewards the character for being the character, right? It rewards Doctor Strange for being a smart asshole. He's an asshole, but like it, it yes. sorry with the swearing, but he's a butt. Uh, the entire movie makes a point of he is a, he is a butt. And then, like, at the very end of the movie, him being a smart butt is the thing that saves the movie. So that thing that you have been, you know, like, knowing about this character that keeps you not liking him, aside from Benedict Cumberbatch having an American accent is always weird. Just, that's a personal thing. But, yeah, the, but the movie loves itself loves that Doctor Strange is smart. 
Did you just call him Cucumber Bat? I called him Bumblebee Cucumber Patch. Hey, Bumblebee Cucumber Patch is a new one. Um, yeah. Benadryl Cummerbund is still my favorite version of that. <laughs> oh boy, there's a... Uh, but yeah, that actually might be my second favorite uh, MCU movie. Now that I oh, now that yeah. I've talked myself through that that sort of plot synopsis again, that that might actually tip it for me. Yeah. Oh, we oh, yeah, we can't forget Thor Ragnarok. Ooh, Ragnarok is really good. It is like that movie. It is a joyful movie, and thank you Taika Waititi for making it. And it, you know, everybody yeah. who worked, but you know, Taika's the head of that project, and man. It, it oh, is such dead. a good recovery from Thor, the Dark Thor. Sorry, yeah, Thor, I... the Dark World is my least favorite MCU movie. By quite no, a bit. Fair. That is also my least favorite one. Um, I'm yeah, really like looking it's... forward to Love and Thunder, though, because oh, I'm really hoping fun. that uh, Natalie Portman, who I respect as an actor, uh, does a great job. Uh, I love that Valkyrie is back in it again because Valkyrie was one of the standouts for me in yeah. Ragnarok. And uh, I'm really hoping that Loki, the TV show Loki, brings Loki back into the MCU, like into the Prime Universe again, so that Loki can just make a mess of things. Because I like Tom Hiddleston and I I love Loki. Like the, the literature or literary version of Loki, like from the Poetic Edda and the Prosaic Edda, is just so awesome. He's, I love him. Thor is not the protagonist of, of those, of the pr Prosaic Edda and the Poetic Edda. So th those are the like written accounts of Norse mythology, for those who are wondering what I'm saying. Um, there are actual like, they weren't written at the time, but these are the um, codified, written down versions of those of those old stories uh, kind of like the ballad of gilgamesh or like the homeric epics um yeah it is that sort of uh historical document but anyway um yeah I, i'm really looking forward to love and thunder that is probably the one movie in the mcu that i am super super stoked to go and see again in theaters i yeah that is actually, I really want to see that one, Peter. It's like, it'll be amazing. Uh, I was so glad I saw Ragnarok. Uh, also, I just like Taika, because what we do in the shadows is probably the most hilarious uh, and best depiction of Tibetan vampires I can remember. Uh, and uh, what's the um, Jojo Rabbit? I oh, also, Jojo Rabbit is amazing. I also, yeah. Everybody loves Jojo Rabbit. It's it's a great movie for all of the right reasons. Very much in the vein of uh, my dad's a huge, and, and I am too, but maybe not as big, a uh, huge fan of, oh, what's his name? Uh, History of the World, Part 1, um, Young Frankenstein. Uh, oh, um... Mel Brooks. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, huge... Huge fan of those things, and Taika seems to be as close to that sort of thing as we're getting in in modern cinematic language. So I really appreciate what's going on there. I I like what he's doing. I like his style of comedy. Big fan. Huge fan. Yep i I like his. He's got he's got the right stuff in making his funny movies about. I mean in the. And Joe the Rabbit, like that's some heavy, heavy. Pardon my language. That's some heavy shit. Yep, that is some heavy heaviness. And I mean, Marty, are you adversely affected by the gravity? Sorry, just every time somebody says heavy, I always remember back to uh, is that that is Back to the Future three or back? To, no, it's Back to the Future two, when he yeah. travels and Marty's like, oh, that's heavy. Is gravity different? Anyway. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. No worries. That no, that was that was a good reference. I appreciate that. I like that now back to the future is all technically back to the past. Back to the slightly before the present. Yeah. Uh back to 2015 before the world started going to garbage. Well, faster and more noticeably. 
think it's more that uh, we are becoming more and more affected by the world going to garbage. There are plenty of people who have had the world going to garbage their entire lives, and I don't want to. I don't want to discount their experience, but yeah, yeah, definitely. There, something snapped when Alan Rickman died. Oh, I was gonna say it was when we shot Harambe. It all came back to that stupid, stupid gorilla. I mean, Harambe's not stupid. He was an innocent gorilla that got murdered in cold blood. But also, something happened. It'll, let me tell you, grandson. It all started when they shot the gorilla. That old meme? Everybody, everyone started dying. And then uh, we all realized that uh, the world leaders we want are Keanu Reeves and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, Arnie's Probably. had his turn on the main stage. I'm not sure that I need another 70 yeah. year old white dude on on in center stage. I, I feel like it's. I just, I just like him because he has donkeys. Yeah, man, he is a great Instagram and a follow and a, and a tank and likes just doing dumb things because he's Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's 70 yeah. and doesn't give a shit. Is he 70 or 80 now? Uh, he's got to he be pushing 80. Yeah, he's got to be close to uh, 80 if he's I mean, already. He also, he also does have the world's only hybrid Hummer H1 because he's like, you know, we've only got one planet right now. Yeah, we will. We will. I, I don't doubt uh, I'm not actually wearing my shirt right now, but I, I do have an Occupy Mars shirt. I have no doubt that in my lifetime, we will be a multi-planetary species. I don't think that solves the problems, but Part of getting the perspective to solve our problems is going to be becoming multi-planetary. Uh, we don't solve the problems of the cave while we're living in it. Um, as much as I don't always appreciate Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, he makes a very poignant point. Um, you don't solve... If we never left the caves, all we would have is really nice caves, uh, making reference to our ancient ancestors who lived in caves. Um, if we'd only ever solved the problems of the cave, we would never know what was beyond. And, and, you know, yes, space exploration is a game for billionaires, and it is horrendously expensive and probably not great for the environment, but boy howdy, we are one errant asteroid away from not existing, all of us, so maybe we should do something about that while we've got time. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. I mean, at least in the last 10 years there's been more announced close calls of asteroids and such and more like sightings of like meteorites like actually like people like hey that landed like you know half a kilometer that way or whatever uh in the last 10 years than i can remember in my whole life yeah and part of it is just how populous we are and how we communicate but also um yeah, we're we're going to get there is going to be a day where it's not a close call anymore and it is it is going to be a thing. Maybe not in any of our lifetimes any of us on this stream, but maybe where we are confronted with an existential crisis that is insurmountable. We we can still do things about climate change. We can still do things about white supremacy. Asteroids aren't something that we have a way of dealing with. It is a a uh, a life-ending disaster that has no solution other than being multi-planetary. And if, if we're going to do it, we need to invest a lot. It is expensive for every time we expand, every time human humanity as a species has pushed the envelopes of what is survivable, it has cost us dearly. Um, my four generations removed ancestors were transported slash uh, chose to be Canadian... Um, Canadians. Uh, we we took this land from those who lived before us, and um, you know, it wasn't fair. Colonialization never was. Um, I know that not everybody that was on the boat that my great-great-great-grandparents, one more great in there, uh, came across to New England, survived that trip. It was not a fun trip. I know that uh, my, on the other side of the, that family that came over, uh, traveled in relative luxury, but it was still a harrowing four-month trip across the Atlantic Ocean in a sailboat. Um, it costs a lot of lives to expand to the New World. It will cost us even more, probably, to expand to Mars and Europa and beyond. At some point, we just got to start doing it. 
and it's not a matter of like let's go there to 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 steal all this resource and screw up i don't want to steal all the resources and screw up another planet i don't want to bring you know out of control the climate change to these places but i also I mean, the thing that terrifies me the most are pandemics, which we've just lived through the first one and first one in modern times, really. Uh, and and asteroids, things from beyond beyond the sun that we can't deal with. Like, there, space is terrifying for all sorts of reasons. It takes like one stray cosmic ray for us to end, uh, you know, modern developed civilization. It. Uh, it takes, you know, uh, an asteroid that we can't see until it is inside of the orbit of Mars to end all of human life right now. Permanently. Like, there's no coming back. There's no Planet of the Apes scenario. There's no, uh, a few of us survive. Like, literally, uh, it takes not a particularly large asteroid to wipe out all of human life. And no, it's terrifying. Not. Nope. It's terrifying, uh, to me at least. Uh, and it feels like something that if we're gonna have billionaires, maybe they should be doing the thing where we get to be multiplanetary. If we're gonna have uh, unrestrained, unfettered, absolutely garbage capitalism that just trods upon uh, millions and billions of people, maybe the benefit out of it is we get to be multiplanetary. Not saying it's a great trade, but it is probably the trade we're gonna get, so we may as well take it. Or we could eat the rich. Also a good option, just saying. If anybody's interested, uh, you know, we could do that too. Maybe capitalism isn't the way. Anyway, that's my that's my political screed that is going to get us uh, fewer followers or more followers. If you believe that capitalism is inherently evil and the exploitation of the working class is the only thing that separates us from... Uh, uh, no, that's not a good way of posing that. Hey, if you love capitalism, give us a like. If you hate capitalism, also give us a like. You can also follow, find me, follow me. I'm Choice Minis on Instagram. Adam, what are you on Instagram? I am at um, beach underscore vacation underscore Mando uh, on Instagram. Yeah, so if you want to follow along with Adam's incredibly slow Mandalorian armor buildup, or you want to spend more time staring at the models that I paint on stream, uh, that's a great place to catch up. Uh, you guys can see some of the progress that we've made with our other project on this channel, Project Never Fallen. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of painting, I'd, I'd say, a pretty cool-looking... Uh, um... I'm really excited for, like... Am I just because I really, really like orcs? Uh, especially Warhammer orcs and all their iterations. They are... When I, when I hear orc, I picture Warhammer orcs more than any other kind of fantasy or sci-fis well i guess mostly fantasy but like in fantasy i picture you know the warhammer or like you know huge hulking savage brutes but i guess in D D they're much less savage or also no the, the bugbears are about the same size as these orcs are yeah which is their like lieutenant slash captains kind of a deal like they're, they're sort of leadership cast because there is a leadership cast in D D for for orcs um yeah you can you can see our other uh stream well not our other stream the same stream uh just on tuesday nights we work on project never fallen which is our hypothetical 40 41st millennia where uh nobody fell to the ruinous powers so all of our fun space marine chapters are still one and whole and they're all brothers and friends eh, probably not brothers and friends but they are at least all still whole still in the emperor's light and uh, they were working right now on a Dark Angel that I'm, I'm having a lot of fun painting. Uh, and also his uh, less in the Emperor's Light buddy. So you can follow along with us. We, we stream on Tuesdays with Project Never Fallen. And on Thursdays, we are working on these guys and uh, the new Helmguard Giants. That's our dwarf uh, Blood Bowl team. So yeah, we're just working on a couple Blood Bowl teams on this chat or on the channel, as well as Project Never Fallen. We're we're getting into or this week on Project Never Fallen, we got through our diorama base for uh for our first diorama to be complete. And we're getting closer and closer. You guys can see that we're we're just smoothing out some of the blends. There's still a little bit of a jump there into that black shadow at the top. But if we are to look at this from approximately the angle that we're going for. You can see we're starting to get nice sort of matte finish 
uh, happening on that shoulder pad. And we're just continuing it across the model. So there is a direction to the light that's pulling this way. We're going to work down here on the uh, on this little knee flap. I'm going to call it a knee flap. Uh, but we're going to work down on that part of it now. And just, again, do a little bit of blending. I'll come back up to this, this top part. Sorry, I'll, I'll keep it on stream. Uh, we'll work on that top part, just getting that blend a little bit closer to being done. Again, with this stuff, um, good news with all of these like orky bits. Um, if you look at our final model, or our, at least our, our test scheme model, which is right here, you can see our fun little orc friend here. Um, we do have a lot of texture on these. Um, we are sort of alternating between like matte shoulder pads, and you can see a little bit more uh, glossy finish on that one. Again, we do a little bit more work on those when we're going to get to the final stages. This guy's about 80% or so. Uh, but you can see that we've done a lot of weathering on these guys too. So there's lots of brown tones. We've got rust mixed in. We've got a little bit of blood mixed in. So we do have some opportunity, not just to refine light and shape, but we are also going to come back a little bit with some with some texture, like with some, with some battle damage and stuff like that, because they're orcs. They're not going to be great at taking care of their armor, even though they're on the fantasy football team. They're 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 gonna orcs got it work right. So we're gonna just add a little bit more battle damage or battle damage and stuff on this. So do they have to be the smoothest blends on on the earth? No. Um, I want to make them relatively smooth because I want to take this to or this army is going to be a part of armies on parade 2022 hopefully uh assuming that i can travel and that it is safe to do so i'd like to take these guys out and take them to a painting competition so we're also going to be working a little bit on some terrain for these guys adam i feel like i'm talking over you uh no not at all um that was actually uh quite interesting to listen to and watch uh, while you painted uh, but on that note, Steve, Yo. it's time for a break. Oh, thank God. Oh, I've needed to pee for like an hour. Oh. I mean, uh, stay tuned, everyone. We'll be back just after a break. We're going to take about six minutes here. We'll be back at about oh, Yo, use the facilities. five to eight or so, a little after that. But yeah, just come on back, hang out. We'll see you guys real soon.
All right. Well, I'm back. We're waiting on Adam, but that's okay. Hope everybody had time to uh, to to run away, take care of business. I got to go pet my dogs, which always makes me happier. Let's keep working on this knee pad here. So again, we're we're we've got a definite light source. So on cam, we're we're pretending that we've got a strong light source basically coming straight out of the camera right now. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make some matte surfaces right now. So again, if we take a look at our example orc, um, we're not going to leave it quite as matte as what it looks like on the example orc, but you know, we're, we're going to keep it somewhere close to that. So uh, let's, let's keep going. So you guys can see that's sort of the example that we're working off of. Now, instead of having this big flashy piece of probably metal here, rusty metal, uh, we're going to be making some sort of uh, matte surface there. But um, we are probably going to have a nice glossy surface on the side here. This is probably going to be metal or something like that when all is said and done. So let's keep working on this little area right here. Um, I, am back I apologize here. if my dogs are making their debut on the stream because uh, that is Artemis and Apollo, uh, my Shiba Inu puppies. Well, puppies uh, might be a misnomer for Artie. She is two. Uh, Apollo is just about to hit. Oh no, he just hit six months. Uh, actually, this morning. So that's that's cool. Uh, congratulations, Apollo. You are now. Oh, for, sorry. Let's see. October, uh, November, December, January, February, April, April. So he's five months old. Five months old. Congratulations, buddy. You survived this long. I'm I'm proud of you, little dude. So again. Um, as I said, we're, we're going to go back and forth here. We're still making some progress as far as the depth of shadow up here on the armor. Um, because this is black armor, I am using a combination of colors. So let's just talk briefly about what's on the palette. Um, here we have our graphite gray. We've got some abyssal blue over here. Uh, and then we're using a combination of white sand for our highest highlight. Then we've got a little bit of tenere yellow there. We also have just straight up black here on the palette too. Now, in order to make things read as the color that they are supposed to be, in order to get something to read as black, we are going to use that. Um, black is one of the more difficult colors to do this with, just because black uh, midtones and uh, shadows are the same color. So we're using this extremely dark combination of desaturated blue as our sort of midtone to light shadows color, and then our deep shadow color here is always the black black. I'm wondering if I have set something so that I just can't hear Adam talking and he's talking away in the background. Yeah. yeah, that is exactly how that worked. Cool. I can hear you, buddy. How you doing, man? Good. Good. Uh, I just um, was looking while well, I was waiting for you to acknowledge uh, your existence again. Yes, that one. Uh, I was looking at my Facebook and I got a notification in one of my groups. Uh, the Makers Cult group, actually. Oh, yeah? Uh, more releases from them. Nice. Part two is now live. Is that a Kickstarter or? Uh, no, that is the the company I got the Thunder Warrior. Three. Oh, cool. The, not the Thunder Warrior, the uh, the Tempest Lord from. Nice. That's yeah. cool. Uh, and they they have uh some like. Um dark mechanicum esque guys on here and so there's that actually looks kind of like a, a new a little bit cool if there was oh, a faction that, that i wish had more development in 40k it would be the renegades uh so renegade guard renegade mechanicum uh, not necessarily the chaos um as i recently learned there is a difference between uh Guardian stuff who fell to chaos and the actual renegades who are just like, no, we don't believe that the emperor is a god. Like, what is wrong with you people? So, yeah. yeah, that is a part of 40k lore that I didn't know existed and I am happy to find out more about. So, if you happen to know more about Renegade Guard or you think that we should do a deeper dive, you can always throw that in chat. You can always throw it up as a comment when you're watching this video later, too. We would love to. Yeah, like. I'm sure at some point, um, Steve and I uh, may, after Project Neverfall is done, it may get into my favorite era of Warhammer, which is uh, the Age of Strife, uh, Unification Wars era uh, of Terra. 
Yeah, that, that is a really cool period of history. You are correct. And especially because, like, it seems like a lot of people are, like, there's now the one, the Maker's Call group, there's a working PDF of rules to play in Unification Era um, Terra. Cool. So there's, uh, it's it's very heavily based off of the Horse Heresy 30k rules, which mm -hmm. are a, uh, from what I've read and kind of glanced over, uh, a better setup for Warhammer rules than 40k. I don't know, man. I haven't played Ninth Ed, so I don't want to pass judgment too yeah, quick. Yeah, but... okay, that is true. But I think the last edition I tried playing was 5. Yeah, I, I'm not not a huge player of these games. I think that um, Kill Team is probably the game I've played. Well, it's definitely the game i played the most of. Yeah, oh, for sure. Um, but, I'm really... I really need to actually open up my 3D software on my computer and send you my picks for the um, Tempest Lords. Yeah, man. If you... if Whenever you get a chance. Uh, 3D printer has been back up and running now for a couple of weeks as i print off some nice. stuff not only for for um some of the accessories for never fallen but i also have been printing some desk ac desk accessories uh brush holders desk and stuff like that because yeah yeah i you know i spend you know 30 dollars a brush for windsor newton uh if you guys are wondering what i use to paint this is I'm doing the majority of the work today with a Windsor Newton 1. Uh, I normally swap back and forth between the Windsor Newton 1 and the Windsor Newton 2. It's just the Windsor Newton 2 had a bad desk drawer day. Uh, it unfortunately got a little mangled in the desk drawer. I'm hoping that I can bring it back with some TLC. Uh, it unfortunately got smushed between some stuff, which is never good for those brushes. Uh, the Klinsky Sable brushes aren't delicate necessarily, but they also don't take well to mistreatment, and I definitely did that. So, um, yeah, I, I decided after pulling that brush out yesterday that I was like, ooh, goodness me, I need to do something about this. So I'm painting, or I printed one set of, of uh, brush holders, and I'm probably going to print a second one now that I've got a sort of prototype -y version of it that I like, because, yeah. 3D modeling. Never easy. <laughs> um, uh, there was a, a Kickstarter I <laughs> um, uh, would have liked to have gotten involved with. Um, that was actually like a learning thing for um, like 3D printing and like a little bit of coding and Arduino and wiring and stuff. And you made like a robot, like a very simple um, 3D printed robotic arm. Ooh. Yeah. But, uh. Hey, someday if we get sponsors, I'm sure that Skillshare will fill in this gap for us. But, uh, I actually yeah. use a lot of Coding Academy, uh, in my day job. I, I, I do actually do a little bit of coding, and Coding Academy is the one that taught me. Something other than C, because uh, I learned C plus in uh, probably elementary school. Yeah, it was definitely elementary school, but not like at school, but from my dad. And then uh, I learned a lot more uh, HTML, CSS, which isn't really a programming language, but JS and stuff I sort of taught myself through uh, junior high and high school. And yeah, I needed a modern, real programming language, so. Uh, Coding Academy has helped teach me uh, Python, and next I'm going to get into a little bit of SQL database, because I need some SQL database for my day job. Nice. Yeah. Um, on that note, Oop. I believe it is time. Is it time? For a contest of champions. A contest of champions! I feel like this one, there's going to be some debate with. So I kind of want to start a little bit earlier so we can finish off with some model stuff. All right. Okay. Well, a contest of champions. So this segment is, it, it's got some rules. Uh, the rules are pretty easy, but uh, just bear with me for just a second. So each one of us, Adam and I, nominate a champion from any place or time in history or fiction, uh, and they compete in a contest. 
They get their normal gear associated with the character. Uh, they don't spend 20 minutes screaming because what 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 fresh hell have they found themselves in? Nope, they just come out like a Pokemon out of a Pokeball. They're they're here to fight uh, or do whatever it is that we tell them. Because in this case, we are the trainers. Now, of course, the champions can't just stand there. Uh, they've got to have some sort of contest to win. So um, we'll roll a D6 here in a second. But Adam, why don't you uh, why don't we start listing off the possible contests for our champions to compete in? Okay, so contests. I should mention about our contests. Every time we roll one, we do replace it. Yes, we will never have repeat contests. If you I mean, want to suggest a contest, you can put it in the chat or in comments, uh, or you can email it to me or DM it to me on uh, on yep, on Instagram. Or join our join our discord and throw it in the general channel yeah we'd love to see you guys in discord so what's uh, the first so one adam number one is a shapeless timeless void of neutral buoyancy where there's inexplic uh, inexplicably light that uh illuminates visible things but there's otherwise nothing the contest is to the death yeah um on a result of two on our d6 we get back the, the contest is get back to Jacques Plain with the idol from the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I love this one. I was I laughed so hard when you told me about this. Yeah. On a result of three, Adam, what happens? Transport and assemble a king size IKEA malm bed frame and mattress with the uh, champion's significant other. The contest is who can do it the fastest and without causing a fight. Yeah. Or significant other. Yeah, fair that enough. That one, I think, pretty much so far, all of our champions would have failed miserably at both of them, and it would have resulted in a draw. I, I feel like, yep, that's that's that one is going to be tough for anyone. Uh, on a result of four, a race around the world occurs in 1873. First to arrive back in London becomes a champion. You are always being followed by the media, so you can't just like. I don't know, go around the corner and, and uh, hang out in the bar until like 80 or so days later. This is the contest is around the world in 80 days. What happens on a result of five, Adam? Amass $1 million in total wealth as fast as possible in the current economic reality of, uh, where is it? The, uh, 2021, starting with, uh, starting from only the materials found in their normal gear. Yeah. Oh, man, mine would win so fast. Okay, and uh, the last, on a result of... Oh, you re read the result of six, but that's fine. That's fine. Okay, on the result of six, out survive the other champion while being chased by Jason Voorhees in an abandoned summer camp. That's what we got? Yeah. Yeah, that is... Oh, nice. Yeah. That's going to be... No, 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 no. That's not what we got. That is, that is the last possible result. So we're going to roll our D6 here, and we will see what... Our, well, before we get to rolling the D6, as reigning champion, I will continue to command the finest flagship or finest flagship in the Federation through Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Adam, who's our challenger this week? Oh boy, you might be a little mad at me for this one, Steve. Oh yeah? Um, my champion is none other than the Dark Lord of the Sith himself, Darth Vader. Oh boy, okay, so we oh, have a Star Trek Star, Star Wars The Executor. Ugh. Is the executioner part of his standard gear? We'll talk about that Wait, in a you second. Get the Enterprise. Okay, so this week we will be competing in contest number five. So it mass a million dollars in total wealth as fast as possible in the current economic five. reality of 2021, starting from only the materials found in their normal gear. Oh wait, no, uh, five actually is the summer camp one. Or are we just doing it in the order we read? We're doing it in the order that we read it, buddy. Okay. So amass a million dollars in total wealth as fast as possible in the current economic reality of 2021, starting from only the material found in their normal gear. Um. Okay, and here is why I say Vader's normal gear isn't the executioner. If we take all of the movies, how many movies yeah. does Vader have the executioner in? Two. I will give you that he has a Super Star Destroyer in two, but he only actually has the Executioner in uh, Return of the Jedi. Because the Super Star Destroyer here is on is the Executor. Yes. In Return of the Jedi. 
And even then, he yeah. is never actually depicted as on the Executioner. He is on... Uh, when he's with uh, Admiral Piet, when they're intercepting the Millennium Falcon, he is on just a regular Imperial class Star Destroyer based off of the bridge. Unless they're the same. Uh, and then in... Uh, as far as I know, they're, they look the same. At least they look the same from the outside. Yes, but when it's depicted from the inside, there is a different bridge that he is on in... Um, when it flashes into... When Luke's having the, the Force conversation with Dad after the end of um, Cloud City in Episode 2, or in Episode 4, sorry, in um, uh, Empire, yeah. it is a different bridge, and that is the only time that he's depicted as being on the Executioner. So... Whereas, my dude, and if we take all of Anakin, how often does he on the Executioner? We'll limit it to Darth Vader, because you said Darth Vader, not Anakin Skywalker. But did say how often? How often? And how normal a part of his gear is it? Because he never actually uses the Executioner. Oh, actually, okay. So the Super Star Destroyer is not his flagship. The Executor is actually just a—it's an execute. Oh no, it is. Never mind. It is the big dagger ship. Yeah, I just read the name wrong. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'll give you. I don't have the executor, but I do have a tie advance. Okay. I'll give you a tie advance. Um. Are you Are you ready for for my opening salvo, or do you want to open with this one? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Replicator, produce a million dollars in twenty twenty one. Oh, that's a good one. Oh man. And and I believe we're done? Yes? I don't know. The um, replicator is gonna take like four to five seconds to do it. Oh wait, no. It wouldn't be that quick though. You'd still have to spec uh, specify like denomination. Okay, know, let's like... say that it takes him an entire minute. Right? Let's say yeah. it's an entire minute for the replicator to okay, a replicator, produce Replicator, can you produce a million dollars in 2021 American currency in a random denomination of bills? Wait, and then that it... doesn't that doesn't work with the way the contest worded though. We have to use our current economic standings in 2021. Can't just no, make in the, the money. Uh, amass a million dollars in total wealth as fast as possible in the current economic reality of 2021. Doesn't say I can't use my the starting only from materials found in their normal gear. The replicator is a part of Picard's normal gear. Earl Grey tea hot. Oh god, damn it! It is like that is. I can't even like the, every episode. <laughs> it's not every episode, but it is at least once a season that he says Earl Grey tea hot. Like, yeah. I don't know, man. Uh, like. I can see Vader, if it wasn't Jean-Luc, I can see Vader winning this contest pretty easily. Uh, wander up to a nerd and offer to sell him your lightsaber for a million dollars? Like, go to Elon yeah. and be like, hey, I need a billion dollars. Here's my lightsaber for it. Need, and then I when Elon's millions. like, I don't want to do that, just force choke him until he does. He's like, hey, Elon, what, do you want to rent the my tie advance for an hour for a million dollars? No. Uh, yes, you do. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, you there do. You go. Yeah. I mean... Okay. Okay. Jedi mind trick. <laughs> Jean-Luc. Er, Je Jedi mind trick. A lower deck crew member. To do... Uh, to sabotage the Enterprise's replicators. So they cannot do that. And then uh, let Elon Musk fly a TIE advance for like 45 minutes. For a million dollars. It would work. He'd be like, okay. Uh, okay. Let him study it for now. Here is... Here His is... engine has four red lights on the back. Okay, so... I, I We're assuming in this scenario that Vader is close enough to get off the message and all the rest of it. Like, they are within sight or whatever the, like, limit of, of force communication is. Yes? Yeah. I guess that, that, is, have, that is the have conceit? Be, it'd, have be, a, it'd have to be... I guess, I suppose like a someone on the bridge. Yeah, I mean or somebody in a, main engineering to just take the replicators yeah. offline, right? 
main engineering would make the most sense because I mean everything on the ship you can you can run every part of the ship for main engineering yes uh actually the redundancy of the Elkar system means that anywhere where you can access Elkars on the enterprise d you can ass- yeah, isn't it like triple redundancies or something on most federation well and and the the design of Elkars specifically i remember reading this is that anywhere you can access a panel for like anywhere where you can interact with the computer as far as having a panel yeah. you can control and all of the enterprise from so numerous times across in in multiple episodes in multiple star trek series yeah after next generation uh in the original series you had to be on the main bridge in order to do certain things like duty positions were still a thing in tos but yeah uh neither here nor there so my counter to your vader uh force controls what am i doing to jedi mind trick okay um is Vader in his Tide Vance, or is it just nearby that he can summon it? Hmm, that would depend. Are we in space above the planet, or are we on Earth? I think that we can we can both safely assume that uh, we can be wherever we want to generate. Um, I feel like in order to make this a, a fair fight, um, you can choose where you want Vader to show up. I think on Earth. Uh, you know what? I'm going to... Vader is going to totally be... He all he will land the tide vans in Elon Musk's front yard. Okay. Um when he's home. I mean, we've already talked about the violation of the Prime Directive that would be bombing Earth in yeah. the the past, so he probably can't we can't have especially the crew of the Enterprise isn't gonna be the ones who are like, okay, let's let's just open up. But um let's just orbly bombard um this you know, famous ancient inventor's house. Yeah. I think that instead, probably what we would do at this point is, once again, uh, an away mission involving Jordy. Um, this is going to be an away wow. mission for the Enterprise crew to just sabotage Vader's okay. TIE fighter. Uh, to steal the Vader's TIE fighter? Oh no, it? just sabotage it. Oh, okay. Um... So a good counter to that is like force sense. The moment they get close to like his fighter, probably one of like the few remaining attachments he has aside from his creepy Sith castle. I like his creepy Sith castle. That was probably creepy my favorite Sith. part of. Uh... I, I I really I do really like that he built that himself by himself. Yeah. For... To um, to torture he... himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, troubled dude troubled dude troubled dude is is putting that pretty mildly yep yeah um no i think with force sense because of how attuned he would be to that fighter i mean because even as anakin he was always like yeah he liked his cars yeah he was a supreme like he's a fighter ace and has been for 40 years okay um fair enough you would probably have some sort of awareness of them there and then you know he would just force choke and like lightsaber slash the away team to death. Yeah, I feel that. Vader. Fair enough. He is a bad guy. Yeah, um, he's, he's not. He's not a good dude in any sense of the word. No, that's that's absolutely truth. Um, I'm just trying to see if there is. Let's see. I mean, I could always go a similar tactic to last week, and we're gonna get. Uh, Barkley in this case, or Broccoli. Broccoli is going to uh, techno babble something, and the deflector dish is going to deactivate uh, Vader's life support apparatus. Um, The moment that starts happening, Vader's going to just force pull the Enterprise out of orbit and make it crash. See, I think that you've got a lot of things going on with Vader's force powers. Oh wait, now. no, that wasn't Vader. That was Star Killer. That was Star Killer. But um, I feel yeah, like you thing. you are still there is a maximum number of things that human force sensitives are able to do, and and there always is. Like there's always some sort of like canonical I can't do any more that they that they always you know like Luke when he's training with Yoda he gets to his I can't do any more with lifting his you know X wing out of the swamp. I feel like there is always some sort of maximum. And even though Darth Vader is like deeply into his like 
I hate everything, including myself, but most especially myself. Um, I still feel like there is a maximum that he can sort of do. Um, so I, I feel like we are probably approaching the maximum number of things Vader can be force concentrating on now. Would you agree? Yeah, no, I can agree to that. Okay. Um, now we play my final card. Uh, I'm so going to have Deanna oh, Troy. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Vader just like flicks a couple switches on his chest. Switch flicker. That's never really fully explained. Yeah, that is his life support pack, but I feel like yeah. the, the, the crew of the Enterprise has dealt with things that are much more technologically like, advanced than a... his life support system. Fair enough, but it like it could be also be so rudimentary that they couldn't really affect it. Localized it affect tachyon him. beam. Localized tachyon beam on that man, please. And then like all of the fucking switches on his chest don't work anymore and suddenly he can't breathe other than using the force to like aid himself. Yeah, like I don't know. Like, does did does Vader even know like the Force heal? Uh, no, that was like part of the deep lore that I don't know is canon anymore. Is that the Emperor specifically never taught him how to like do yeah, the like, healing kinda, bits and I'm would always be more, the like, one who would heal him so that he could like other than the like back to treatments and whatnot. Uh, but the Emperor was like deeply involved in keeping Anakin alive, according to the Emperor. Um. So that Anakin never felt like he had agency over his own health, right? And so that yeah. he would never turn yeah. because he is kept purposefully weak by the Emperor so that the Emperor has a nice lapdog instead of a snarling, ferocious bulldog. A rabid wolf, more likely. Rabid dire wolf. Yeah. Well, if Vader ever got enough agency, he would... Oh yeah, he does that. And then he immediately murders the Emperor. Huh, weird. Yep. Um... Kind of he just kind of was like, oh, I'm the bad guy now. Well, I'm just going to be real good at this. Like, I was real good at being a Jedi Knight before this. He was not very good at being a Jedi Knight. But then again, none of the Jedis were particularly no. good at being Jedi Knights. If they're supposed no. to be calm, peaceful, rational monks, they're all real, real bad at it. Just, just real yep. bad. Sorry, I'm painting off stream. Uh, right. right now, I'm just working shadows back into this heavily textured area of armor, we're going to go over it in a couple of layers to really make this texture stand out. Chat, um, that wants to chime in right now with maybe something, a tidbit of for either Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the Enterprise. Oh, I so, still got another idea for the crew, Enterprise crew. You didn't yeah. even let me explain how Chancellor yeah. Troy comes into this. So right now we have Vader is in a crisis. Like he's trying to deal with the away team who is currently like taking care of his stuff. All of his gear is starting to malfunction yeah, on him. Except for, well, Data's there. Like, Data doesn't die. No, he no, he just, he just like, cuts, like, dismembers. Like, Data, severed head. Data. He's just, like, talking. So, Data is, okay, at the end of, what's it called? Um, the one with the Borg Queen, where do they travel back in time? First Contact. Yeah, okay, so at the end of First Contact, when they're in the boiling pool of plasma... Want to remember what happens to Data then? Nothing. His skin melts off. The skin they gave him melts off. Yeah, right? Data, the android Data. parts of Data, continue to function. What is what is a lightsaber made out of? Plasma. Stuff? Yeah, plasma. Plasma. Boiling pool of plasma that surrounds the Enterprise warp engine. Plasma coming out of a, a out of a lightsaber. Gonna go with Data survives, even getting stabbed with a lightsaber. Well, I was gonna say like, yeah, Data lives, but he's still like a dismembered, like body parts. Oh sure, yeah, okay, fine. Like, but I mean, we can agree he, that Vader is reaching the limits of his like, yeah, I mean, he's also an experienced, an, an experienced like fighter of droids, androids, like. Oh yeah, sure. No, I'll I'll totally give Vader that too. Um, like. But He's I, like, oh, android, smash you against a rock. Yeah, and, and then just smash you with the rock repeatedly. Oh yeah, I, and I'm just saying that Data is more durable than like a B1 battle yeah. droid, right? Data is uh, made of some. I can't. What is it? He's made of titanium alloy or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's either titanium alloy or durlin, dur, dur aluminium alloy, and I can't remember which one it is, it's but it's one, one of those of the weird Star Trek metals. But 
Yeah. Yeah, like he is he is nigh indestructible. I think the only I mean he jumps can... down an entire nuclear missile and says hello. That's the beginning of first contact. Oh yeah. Yeah. Jumps oh, down the one. entirety of a Minuteman three nuclear missile, which is I don't know, we can look it up, but I'm sure it's over two hundred feet. Yeah, like like that is that is human human squish. But since he's not human, he survives it, no problems. Um okay. So Forkley's hitting him with the 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 um the deflector dish. I'm gonna have yeah. at this point in time, I am going to have Deanna Troy, because I can control them and give them this insight. Have yeah, him you, you, uh you do have Deanna Troy is going to empath into him because she does this with other people who are have like telekinetic abilities she can talk to her mom uh she is yep. going to talk in padme's voice into anakin's man mind and be like why didn't you save me anakin skywalker and do like all of the flashback things that are just gonna make vader's the saddest boy yes we all know what happens to vader when he gets sad he gets ragey and then everything around him dies uh, he also becomes irrational, so... Uh, yeah, that's very true. Oh, man. So, Vader becomes irrational, kills Elon Musk and his family. That's really what uh, I was going then, for, is yeah. irrational Vader is uh, now on a rampage and is nigh on uh, uncontrollable. He would realize that it was Deanna Troy, hop in his TIE Advance, and then it would be the TIE Advance versus the Enterprise D for whichever one dies or di is disabled first. Uh, no, we're we're still going for my million dollars, and at this point in time, Vader is doing nothing about my replicators anymore. Okay, true. Like you could get the million dollars, but Vader's still going to destroy the Enterprise anyway. Oh, he will try. I I, I, I honestly don't think the Tie Advance can destroy. The I don't think the Tie Advance destroys the Enterprise either. He may be able to dodge the phasers no, like, for like the very days. Most he could he could do would be like to kamikaze it the Tie Advanced into the bridge area while simultaneously launching himself out to like stab the ship with a lightsaber because that's what Jedi and Sith do. They'd like to stab ships with lightsabers because that's a fighting style in the uh long, long time ago. I, I'm gonna um uh, I, I will grant you uh that 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 is probably as close as it gets. Um Having already wasted data on the surface, we don't have a great officer. Uh, Worf misses a lot. Attack. Uh, a little disappointing how often our Klingon warrior friend misses with his with his guns. But at some oh. point, yeah, I feel like uh, at some point they are going to separate the ship, and then Vader has a real choice to make. Because both of them are fully armed and operational. And as soon as you have two different firing stations, you can corner yeah. people. Even in three dimensions, you can use two different firing positions to corner yeah. a, a like ship. They're both, they're both equally as armed. Yeah. And both of them have are potent in 360 de degrees. Like, they're both potent in the X, Y, and Z axis in all, de in all dimensions. So, like, in yeah, all degrees you. between. So... The tie advance is only effective in its forward facing arc. Yeah, so I feel like at some point in time, uh, even with Worf at tactical, uh, they're going to eventually win. So, yes, I, I, I will agree that uh, at some point in time, Vader is going to probably murder a good portion of the crew of the Enterprise. No. Yeah. No doubt for me on that one. I I believe that that is like it will the case. be the it will be the like the ultimate fanboy hallway fight scene of Vader slaughtering his way through Star Trek crew members because I love that I, scene. Can, can that can scene was terrifying. A phaser. Ooh, that's a good question. Like, would it, and like because the phaser is a beam and it's a continuous beam, if he blocked one, could he just like redirect the whole beam? Uh, so the the deal with uh, blasters in Star Wars is that they're not actually um, 
lasers. They're not actually they're lasers. lasers. Like, it's not light energy. It is firing a projectile, right? And yeah. they're blocking a projectile. Yeah, blaster bolt. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Like, I... I don't even know if but you like, can block I don't know, it. Lightsabers, lightsabers can block other lightsabers, and they're just beams of plasma. Fair enough. Um, so, may, maybe? I feel like that has to do with... Okay, so, like, the best guess we have of how a lightsaber works is it is uh, basically... Uh, like, it's a controlled nuclear reaction, right? So you're using magnetism to uh, keep the nuclear reaction within confined to a small area, right? Um, yeah. That makes sense that a a charged, like a, a a a magnetic a magnetically charged space like that would repel another magnetically charged space, like a, a similarly charged magnetic space, which is how lightsaber blocks lightsaber. Yeah. I don't know if it interacts with photons because I don't know enough about physics. Like I'm gonna That's expose fair. my ignorance on this. I don't know for sure, so we'll say that yeah, he can block phasers with his lightsaber. Why not? Like that sounds okay. Solid. I mean, it just it just sounds cool for Darth. Yeah, Vader. exactly. That sounds solid. Uh, I'm in favor. Yeah, like that that just makes da Darth Vader walking through a corridor on the Enterprise, slaughtering his way down the hallway, a little bit cooler because it's like, oh hey, there's a group of security men there. They one of them shoots a phaser rifle at, blocks it, and just cuts them all down. Yeah, it just redirects that beam and it's like. And then continual like oh that scene at the end of Rogue One. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that so scene in Rogue One. Oh, it's so good. So good. that's that is. I remember whooping. I don't know if I did it out loud when we were at that movie, but I definitely have whooped for that scene since then. So. I'm pretty sure the first time I saw that in theater, I smiled so hard my face hurt, and I don't smile very often. So. This is true. Saying a lot. Um. Yeah, I, I honestly, okay, so, okay, I, I'm definitely for that. Vader could slaughter most of the crew of the Enterprise, but since yeah, like I'm, the, I would, and I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know that there is anybody on the Enterprise that is a melee yeah, like, counter to Dark putting, Vader. Like, I don't even think putting up force fields would stop him because he would just hack his way through a bulkhead. Uh, yeah, they do wraith shields and manage to get them, and there are instances like would, in TNG where they down? use. They are there are instances in TNG where they use uh, force fields to like block access to people, right? Um, um, I mean, there are a bunch of yeah, primitive yeah. settlers, but uh, I can yeah, think of probably they, they more do examples do, like, in like hallways to like cordon them off and like stop them getting around. But I honestly don't think Vader would walk into one and then just destroy the sheet, like just cut his way th around the shield. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, no, I, I I grant you, absolutely, that Vader would slaughter the entire crew of the USS Enterprise-D. Uh, whether it takes yeah. him a while or is a quick fight, yeah, one way or another, it's going to be a thing. They are, they are going to end up very, very hurt. Possibly all of them dead. But I will have long since made a million dollars. Yeah, you will have won the contest, but not survived the contest. Oh, no, no, no. I get to... Well, I mean, they're back one week or another. I put them in their Pokeball, we take them to Nurse Joy, and they're they're back to go next week, but... I mean, we could, we could leave this up to the chat and comments and messages to whether or not Jean-Luc survives to battle again. You and I are sole arbiters on this one, buddy. They get, okay. to su they get to suggest the scenarios in which we fight. And if you really want to see Jean-Luc go down or possibly Darth Vader, I feel like Darth Vader is, is out on this one, though. Are we at least going to agree to that? I Vader loses. This was honestly the only contest on there I think he would have lost. Fair. That is, that is true belief in your champion. Um, um, but... Though, I so, don't think John Luke or the Enterprise crew survives. If you are absolutely adamant that I could not choose, let's, I mean, let's let's set a maximum limit. If somebody wins more than five contests, they're done, right? They get retired, they go into the Hall of Champions, choose a new yeah. champion, right? Yeah, fair enough. I like that one. 
are if you guys have suggestions for new contests in which Jean-Luc Picard can be challenged. And if you hate that Jean-Luc keeps winning, uh, you're not alone. Adam at this point is likely frustrated that I have won three contests with Jean-Luc. Two contests with yeah, two in a row with Jean-Luc. I mean, I honestly thought I had you with Darth Vader. I was like, Darth Vader is gonna just Hey man, just I did not think that Gandalf the Grey would lose to a bunch of tribbles. <laughs> that so. is true. Gandalf losing to Tribbles was yeah. But again, it, it was the only contest that the Tribbles were gonna win. Yeah, a hot dog eating contest is not something Gandalf is gonna win. But if you guys like, have I... suggestions for other contests or for for ways to Jean-Luc Picard to go down in flames, you guys can put them into the chat. You can put them into the comment oh. section, or you can DM Jean-Luc's them to last move would be destroying the damn ship. Oh yeah, yeah, it absolutely would. He would Everybody puts the Enterprise into uh, self-destruct mode, auto-destruct mode. That is always every, something they do. It's it's a plot thing. Every Star Trek series has one or two moments throughout it, whether they almost blow up the ship. Oh, uh, I mean, space station. between the movies and TNG, it happens like a half dozen times. Yeah, like it happens in Voyager. It, oh, it happens a lot in Voyager, moment. too. Yeah, Um uh, when they DS enter fluidic space. Remember, yeah. DS9, I only remember it actually happening once when the Cardassian virus gets loose. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I don't remember any other times. The, And I don't remember it ever happening on the Defiant where they almost blew up the ship. The Defiant either was like destroying everything around it or almost being destroyed. That was kind of its balance on the show. It was like... I'm going to kill it. I'm really going to blow up other ships. Oh, no, I'm being blown up myself. Yeah. So if you guys have other contests in which you want to see Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the Enterprise D be destroyed, go ahead, put them in chat, put them in the comments, send them to me on Instagram. I am at choice minis. Adam is at beach underscore vacation Mando, or you can send it to our email address, just choice minis at gmail.com. Any of those will get to us. We will add you into that rank of six uh new or rank of six contests of champions if you really want to see Jean-Luc go down Adam buddy you get to choose a new champion this next week and uh yeah I am the champion well actually Jean-Luc yeah, and I, the like, Enterprise oh. DR yeah like the if it was just Jean-Luc no contest yeah but Jean-Luc is the captain of the Enterprise that yeah. is his I mean, regular gear. Is he has an ar- He has a research flash army vessel to uh, delegate his commands to. That is what he do. I mean, I should have specified from the Marvel Darth Vader's comic series where he's regularly on the bridge of the Executor. Yeah, I mean that could have helped you in this case. I still don't think that they have enough firepower to take out the Enterprise D, and here's why. I get taken out by an A-Wing. At no point on screen does uh, any of the Star Destroyers take out a capital ship. Yeah, they are actually, they are... The Star Destroyers never take out a capital ship, even in, like, Rogue One. Um, no, it's, it's usually left to the fighters to do that. Yeah, so in capital ship versus capital ship battle, and I know that there is a size mismatch yeah. between the Enterprise D and the Executioner. But then, you know, the Executor launches other Star Destroyers and swarms of fighters and just overwhelms the Enterprise system. Oh, yeah, but we're dealing with a whole bunch of really super smart super smarties, and they're going to be like, oh, well, okay. And then they oh, just fuck off at war. still have... Yeah, that is that is actually totally fair. Um, did the Super Star Destroyers still have like the big cutting like siege beam in the landing bays that they had during the Clone Wars? That is an excellent question because I don't think I've ever watched that part of Clone Wars. Uh, um, that's actually at the beginning of Revenge of the Sith. Um, in the opening, you see it in the background in the opening space battle scene above Coruscant, where one of the um, Republic cruisers is, like, over top of one of the Separatist cruisers, and you see, like, the big, open, like, white glowing landing bay, and then just, like, a big, uh, like, blue-white beam like, shoots out, and it has, like, the classic kind of Star Wars giant beam gun noise. 
huh. and it like cut like blows the ship in half automatic i just i want like to like galactic empire era ones keep that weapon because it feels like they wouldn't like star destroyers are bigger than the republic cruisers like the the heavy like clone cruisers those are like quite a bit smaller than the imperial class star destroyer yeah there's also a bunch of different classes of star destroyer and i think that I, I honestly i don't know if somebody knows and can help us out with this you're more than welcome to put the put it in the comments i mean that's on screen that is like the only vi honestly viable weapon like anti-capital ship weapon the star Destroyer, star destroyer have other than that they're just covered in anti-aircraft yeah whereas the federation is exclusively capital ship versus capital ship combat yeah there are no there are occasionally smaller ships uh the defiance one of them and there are occasionally armed shuttlecraft but they're never used in combat outside of the defiant yeah the only oh and the runabout the only... on uh on ds9 ds9 yeah um the only actual named fighter on screen is in uh star trek insurrection uh data flies it in the very right beginning. It's the yeah peregrine heavy fighter or something like that yeah i forget about that movie because it's bad uh i enjoy michael dorn's wharf one-liners in that movie when he's just going through going on puberty which sounds absolutely terrifying yeah there's not many things that are playing on blank that i want to ever go through in my life uh no i you know i would like to drink some blood wine maybe eat some gah not a huge fan of mealworms i've eaten them before it's not really my deal i mean if it, it came down to being starving to death and eating mealworms I, i'd eat mealworms like weird like flat noodly worm yeah still not a huge fan I've, I've eaten my share of insects there are some that i don't care like they're just mm -hmm. um specifically i'm thinking of crickets right now there are yeah, some I... that i am not a fan of that's mealworms and there are some that uh i would eat on a pretty consistent basis if they're more available i'm thinking like ants ants i i i'm not going to eat the ones that are in my garden but like no problem eating ants Uh, I haven't, I haven't actually had ants. I've had crickets before, though. I had chocolate-covered crickets from Bernard Calibre. Yeah, and crickets are just... They're a little powdery for my taste, but it could be just the way that I ate them. Um, yeah, ants yeah, were, out of all of them, were... just sort of crunchy and nothing, so... Yeah, my crickets were definitely um, inside uh, small hunks of really tasty milk chocolate. Yeah, and that's totally fair. Uh, that is a good way to sort of get around the powdery nature of crickets, uh, is to wrap, envelop them in a nice, smooth, melty chocolate. So, so uh, as you can see here, we're just sort of refining some of the shapes on, on our dimply armor here. Um, right now, I'm going back and forth with sort of mid-tone glazes, and, and some shadow mix, as well as those highlights that we worked up, we'll come back to make this even more dimply looking. So if you take a look at this, guys, this is our, our test model. You can see on the front of his armor in this like reflective position, uh, you can see where I've accented some of those dimples. We're doing basically the same thing here with, with our, uh, with this armor, knowing that our lighting position is from this side, right? So even though this side is shadowed, um, we're still picking out a lot of this texture and we'll use a series of glazes to sort of bring that back because it's still a little high, especially seeing where the light condition is on this side. This is lower down the model. So if we just look at the model from the front, it's a little bit lower down. And one of the ways to create drama with lighting is also to modulate light from top to bottom on the model. So the top, the furthest up part is always the brightest part and we modulate the way down. That's not actually how light works in real life. Um, I am equally lit on the top of my person as I am at the bottom because the amount of difference between my feet and my head is about six feet or so 
um, and the sun is 93 million miles away. Like, the difference between those ratios doesn't make sense, but we take some artistic license when it comes to painting minis because uh, otherwise they look boring. And just like we don't use blue shadows in real life, like reality doesn't have blue shadow or blue cast to its shadow, we use blue and, you know, yellowy white light because it makes for more interesting paint jobs. That's, I don't have a better way of justifying it. Artistically, it's interesting, so we do it. Not because it is accurate. If we were doing an accurate representation of things, uh, these models would all look very different from how they are painted. And even the realistic quote unquote models, um, we can go look through, you know, go look through your, 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 not heavy metal style, but the more realistic style. So I'm talking about like Sergio Calvillo or, um, well, hell, even Angel Horaldis. Uh, they modulate lumosity between the top and the bottom of the model, the top of the model, and also points of focus. So things like the face and stuff like that tend to be brighter than the rest of the model, just because they tend to be brighter, because that is like good artistic sense, not because that is uh, reality. Even if you go and look at like old masters and stuff, they would manipulate light. And I'm talking about like um, Renaissance masters or even classics masters. Faces are generally illuminated way more than the rest of the body. And they manipulate light to do that. And they drop light in like, if you take a look at Rembrandt, for example, which I think is a really good inspiration. If you're looking for inspiration on how to paint dynamic light on a miniature, um, look at what Rembrandt does. There are parts of clothing that just disappear um, that would otherwise be visible that he just throws into inky blackness uh, because it makes for a more dramatic striking figure. And that's what we're doing here. We're, we're making dramatic striking tiny figures like this guy is thumb sized. So we got to make some differences with our, our dynamism. The dynamics of light have to be amplified. Okay. One last bit here before we go, I'm going to build the, the shine back up a little bit on this guy, just on this, this knee pad. And then we'll probably call it a night after that. Uh, unless, you know, somebody hops in chat and is like, keep going forever, Steve. As much as I would love that to happen, I also go to bed like 20 minutes after we finish streaming. Oh yeah, uh, I go and well, I go and eat dinner normally, and then uh, touch my dogs a whole bunch because I love them, little goofballs. Um, yeah. and then I go oh, to bed. Man. I just saw a post on uh, Instagram about the uh, jets that we almost got the X thirty two and the YF twenty three. Yeah, the YF twenty three was always an interesting one to me. Um, I really, it's it's. I mean, not that it matters for the plane. I find the YF-23 more aesthetically pleasing than the F-22. Fair enough. And the YF-23 was a real gamble um, in a lot of ways. Um, it is, it's a really cool aircraft. I, I can't say that I understand the decision behind uh, choosing the YF-22 other than it is a much more conservative design. It was basically a hopped up F-16 with an extra engine and... Um, some extra bits like the the stealth technology advanced radar systems um this is like the yf-22 basically just a stealth f-15 sort of um it it's an air superiority fighter which the f-15 isn't uh the f-15 is an attack weapons platform the f-16 was our air superiority fighter so in the rfp like when the when the united states dod went out to replace this f-16 which they are in the process of with the f-35 finally um, they wanted uh, an air superiority fighter, which the F-15 did serve that role when you get to the F-15D, but even then, it, it's not really an air superiority fighter. They're actually still producing F-15s. There is now the F-15 uh, Silent Eagle, which is a third generation stealth fighter uh, that you can buy from Boeing. It's just the F-15 with... Uh, stealth coating on it and it's easily defeated by most modern radars so yeah uh but yeah the 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 yf-22 is it's as far as i remember and and again i could be wrong on this i'm fairly certain i'm right 
it was originally RFP'd as an air superiority fighter, which means that it was meant to take the role of the F-16, uh, high acrobatics, high G weapons deployment stuff. Um, that was where it was supposed to take care of things. Is it supposed to go out and hunt non-existent MiGs or JU-2s or uh, what is the new uh, Chinese one, the JA-5 or whatever it is? Like it, yeah. it's supposed to shoot down other fifth or other fourth and fifth generation aircraft. So, so I'm pretty happy with the smoothness of the blend as I get my hat in the way. Forgot to take my hat off when I came back inside. Um, I'm pretty happy with where we're at with the smoothness of the blend along this knee pad. I'm just going to go in and add a little bit of texture to the side of it just so that it's a little bit more interesting and it's not quite smooth and flat. Uh, I'll, I'll integrate this a little bit more into the actual uh, armor panel here in a minute. But again, with our, our high highlight, that ye off yellow color, and then I'll just bring that more into line with the rest of it because... It's not that we don't edge highlight, it's that if we're going to edge highlight, there has to be a purpose behind it. So we're not going to just edge highlight every edge, regardless of whether or not it catches the sun. In this case, this edge along the front of the knee pad here is definitely catching sun. And there'll be some like checks and stuff, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more when we get to weathering. But there'll be checks and chips along this paint on the side that'll definitely catch more light. Um, a good example of this, if we take the Orc of Learning, uh, this is our glossy Orc of Learning. You can see that most of the edges that catch light are very, very light, but all of the edges are somewhat visible, regardless of whether or not they are reflecting fully. Um, on matte surfaces, however, all of the edges are clearly visible. It's not that they're reflecting more light, it's just that because there is a difference in material on both sides, it's more easily identifiable that you can see an edge on a matte surface. That just happens to be because of the difference in lighting conditions. So we can see there's a fairly like, I don't know if that shows up on camera or not, but there is a fairly large difference in the, the, the depth of black. And there is a very definite edge between them. And that edge appears lighter than either side of it, just because of the contrast between those two elements. So even though I know that this is fairly flat to the camera right now, this side at least appears to be very much darker than this side even though they're the same color, uh, just because of how light is reflecting between them. Weird. We're going to talk about light a lot when I talk about the painting part of things on this channel. Otherwise, we'll be arguing about whether uh, the Enterprise can blow up a Star Destroyer. Tune in for more about whether or not a, the Enterprise can blow up a Star Destroyer. Yeah, like, I, I have to look up like, I know everyone's like, oh, they would just beam a, like, photon or torpedo to the bridge, but, like, a lot of people don't know Star Trek ships do have shields. Star Wars and Star Trek both have shields. Or, yes, uh, Star Wars, sorry. That's Star Trek. It's the shield, um, so, uh, having read the novelization of uh, Return of the Jedi way too many times as a child, um, so what happens in that sequence? So, uh, at the very end, right after the Emperor dies, uh, it immediately slam cuts into the A-Wing crashing into the bridge of the Star Destroyer, right? Just before that sequence where the Emperor dies, there is a scene outside where the shield generators, the like round, uh, not actually round, but the many faceted geodesic domes uh, that are over top of the... Those are the shield generators on capital ships, on Imperial capital ships specifically. Uh, and one yeah, of those fails, yeah, which is why the A-Wing can just fly straight through the, like, conning tower of the Executor. Yeah, the, I think it's the, um, the, not the original cut of the, of Jedi, but the second one where they added in, like, some of the extra scenes or whatever. Like, the extra... Ooh, I thought it was in the original cut, but I could be wrong. Like, where, where you actually see the shield generator blow up before that happens. Two X-Wings dive vomit and it blows up. That's all I remember. Yeah. Is that in the original cut? It's been at least two decades since I watched the original cuts on THX. In THX, rather. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it has been a while. I, do, I mean, I do own... I would love to see 
the original cuts. Um, Disney, if you have any means to make that happen, please just do it. I'm not saying that I just won't watch Star Wars again on Disney Plus, but like, if you give us the ability, we would love that. I know that George Lucas had a vision, but George Lucas's vision is sometimes bad. Episode two. Uh, yep. I mean, George Lucas could have used that. about a thousand people who were willing to say no to him during that time. I mean, can you also counter that with um, episode seven, eight? Angel? Oh, yeah, no, I'm not saying that everybody makes perfect Star Wars movies or that George Lucas was the worst person to make a Star Wars movie. I, d I don't care. Like, I could rank Star Wars movies from my opinion of worst to best, but like, uh, uh, even episode eight is my. I, I. There are parts of episode eight that I do not like. Panto Bite, for example, is. That in that. 45 minutes of that movie didn't matter and did not need to be in the movie because it has no effect on the plot whatsoever. It's just an excuse for two characters to be alone together. Uh, I think it was Ryan Johnson trying to expand the Star Wars universe. And and I respect that. Ryan Johnson still got a Star Wars movie that's in uh, in uh, production. Like, he didn't get taken off of Star Wars. He still has another movie to make for them, so... It was originally a trilogy, but I think it's down to one movie now, just because they're also shortening the cycle yeah. for how much Star um, Wars or how much Star Wars we're getting. Regardless, I'd um, like to see another scum and like more scum and villainy. Yeah, if we were gonna go with like dream things that I would love to see in the Star Wars mo or in in Star Wars, um, you know how we played Edge of the Empire that couple of times. Yeah, that that I would love to see more of. Um, what the Wild West, because at its heart, um, Star Wars is a spaghetti western directed by a person who is imitating a Japanese director. Like, there are Kurosawa yeah. films that... Kurosawa spaghetti westerns? If that's a genre? But, yeah, I... I, I, I I I feel like that is when it's at its best, and I would love to see more of the Mandalorian. Almost gets there. Uh, I really enjoy the Mandalorian. I really like, enjoy the Mandalorian as well. Um, like, I I like the his character development like over the course of season one through all of season two. Yeah, and for those who haven't seen it, the one episode where he. I mean, it's he kind of he does get a culture shock because he meets another clan of Man Mandalorians that treat the like. Oh, they have a very different culture. Yeah, they have it like because they're different clans, and that's one thing a lot of people don't know is that every Mandalorian clan has different kind of interpretations of the Mandalorian code, uh, and it just so happens that. Uh, Din Djarin is was raised by uh, essentially the Death Watch. Yeah, and, and and I do love a lot of aspects of the Mandalorian. Like I, I do really appreciate that TV show for what it butthole showed cave. us. Uh, yeah, the most butthole cave that has ever but been a butthole or cave put on screen. Yeah. Um, but it is it is one of those things that. Um, yeah, I would love to see more of that sort of ethos without the space wizards. Like, I am perfectly happy to see um, the Mandalorian as just Mandalorian. I haven't watched all of season two. Uh, I think I watched a couple of episodes at the beginning of season two. I know what happens because I live on the internet, so it's all been spoiled for me anyway. But uh, it's one of those things that... Um, yeah, I would love to see a Star Wars movie that is not centered around force users not centered around the super powered but centered around like the lone man in his frontier and i think that that's really what i appreciated most about i mean season one I of mando solo kind of did that solo was a bad movie I made like worse solo. by what it could have been no see like uh, here's my problem with it's solo western train hype 
so we don't have time for this we don't have time for this on stream we will have to come back next week to argue about why solo is my least favorite movie in the star wars entire extended saga um yep it's below episode two and we can all fight about it later okay i am steve thomas at choice minis it's not that bad it's not episode two thank bad. you everybody for watching commenting and being with us today uh <laughs> i'm just gonna talk over adam until uh Till uh, the end of the show. Adam, where can people follow you and support you in saying that Solo isn't the worst movie in the Star Wars tr or Star Wars universe? Um, They can follow me at beach underscore vacation underscore Mando on Instagram and follow my incredibly slow journey into the world of Mandalorian cosplay. If you like haven't... what you saw, take a moment to give us a like, subscribe, hit the stupid little bell so you can hang out with us. If you have suggestions for other models or that we, uh, models that we can feature in, in the uh, the Hits on 2 Plus segment, or you have segment suggestions that you think we could take on, or you want to contribute to the Contest of Champions, go ahead. You can email me at Choice Minis. You can hit us up on uh, Instagram. You can join our Discord. Uh, if you want to support us, you can buy our merch. You can uh, donate a coffee or a beer, a uh, beer to Adam, a coffee to me, or just, you know, share, like, tell your friends that we're here. We would love to have them on the stream with us so that they can help us argue about yes. why Jean-Luc Picard is the ultimate champion. Adam, I love you, man. Love you too, dude. He may be the ultimate champion, but I'm pretty sure he died. We'll see you guys on Tuesday. We'll be back here for chapter four of Project Never Fallen on Tuesday, April 27th at eight o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Pacific time at six o'clock right here in lovely Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Do something about white supremacy, a cab, and get vaccinated. Love you guys very much. Have a great night. <laughs>